Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today as the National Board of Public Health Examiners presents the third in our series of six webinars geared towards explaining the domain areas of public health to help you prepare for the upcoming CPH Certified in Public Health Examination. Each study session will be led by an expert faculty from ASPPH member schools and will focus on one of the five core areas of public health. Each segment will be uh, two to three hours in length and include a presentation, lecture, and interactive segments. A break will be offered midway through the presentation. This presentation will be recorded and archived on the MBPHE website one to two days afterwards. You may register for the remaining three sessions on the MBPHE website. Today's session feature is epidemiology. Please feel free to key in your questions in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, and we will answer questions at the, uh, at the end of the session. We are pleased to have Paul Terry, Associate Professor of the University of Tennessee Departments of Public Health and Surgery, here to present to us on the topic of epidemiology. Paul, you can begin. Thank you. Hi, my name is Paul Terry. I appreciate your being here with me. Um, if this is just a refresher for you, then hopefully this will help clarify some of the principles of epidemiology that you've already learned. On the other hand, if this is new material for you, it will probably be necessary to go over these concepts again before your exam. There are many slides here and we won't be able to linger too much. Uh, it is also possible that we won't get to every last slide, but that is okay too. Know the basics well and don't worry about the minutia. Focus on making the basics rock solid. Everything flows from the basics. Another thing to note is that many concepts in epidemiology are open to interpretation. For example, I'm planning to introduce terms such as prevalence and rate. And that reminds me that there was once a years-long battle in the literature between Elon Johnson and Mietnam as to whether a prevalence could be called a rate and whether the term prevalence rate was even valid. Their argument even got personal once or twice. This shouldn't concern you now, but please do realize that underneath any concept or formula in epidemiology, a controversy may be lurking. If you think I'm going too slow or too fast, and there will be both opinions, I'm sure, I apologize in advance. However, I'm available for questions any time by email after the presentation is over. For example, this weekend, next week, the week after, etc. So I think they'll give um, my email address. If I can answer your question, I'll, I'll, you know, of course, I'll do my best. Um, it's PD, P like Peter or Paul, D like David, T like Thomas, E R R Y, so PD Terry at utk.edu. Okay, so let me make sure I know how to work these slides. Um, click on this presentation and move the arrow. There we go. Okay. So today's objectives, review the review of basic topics covered in the epidemiology section of the exam. Of course, I, don't, I didn't take the exam. I don't know exactly what's in the exam. I'm doing uh, what I think is the basics that would be covered in the exam. Materials covered cannot replace basic epidemiology course, obviously. You're getting a two to three hour lecture today, and there's more to epidemiology than that. So please do read a good book like uh, Leon Gordis, I think they're up to the fifth edition. That's a, a pretty well-appreciated book by students. Leon Gordis, Epidemiology, um, I think they're up to the fifth edition, but the fourth edition or third edition would, would work for you as well. Uh, this re uh, review will be archived, as they said, on the NBPHE website under Study Resources. So definition and term terminology of epidemiology, we're going to look at measures of disease frequency, epidemiologic study designs, causation, we'll talk a little bit about causation, and screening for disease. Starting with the definition, epidemiology is the study of the distribution and determinants of health-related states or events in specified populations and the application of this study to control health problems. That's not the only definition, by the way. And there's a couple of things to point out. Um, one thing is that health-related states or events is a rather cumbersome way of saying outcome or disease. 
uh, it's more it's more accurate because sometimes we're not looking at a disease we're looking at um, a cure even so the outcome could be whether you're cured or some other health related state or event but for the purposes of this talk I will be using disease um, it's a lot easier to say so I'll, I'll refer to the outcome as disease but just bear in mind that disease is not the only outcome in epidemiology. Another thing that's highlighted here is distribution because distribution and determinants are two separate issues. They're not completely separate um, but distribution only goes so far. It doesn't tell you what's the cause of, of the disease but it's a very important start so that's where we're going to start with the distribution of disease in specified populations. So disease distribution, how common is it? Who is, who is affected? When does it occur? Where does it occur? Basic questions in epidemiology. Starting with the first one. Endemic, epidemi epidemic, and pandemic. Endemic, usual presence of a disease within a given population. Epidemic, occurrence of a disease clearly in excess of normal expectancy in a defined community or region. So are we having an epidemic of diabetes right now in the United States? Is that, uh, is that, is that what we're having? Or is it endemic? Pandemic, worldwide epidemic. I'm sure, uh, well, for me, the, the most obvious example is um, the pandemic of AIDS, if you go back uh, a couple of decades when we first had an epidemic in this country and then pretty soon it was in Asia, it was in Africa, it was in Europe, it was in North America, Australia, it was a pandemic at that point. Um, there's some question, you know, I, you know if, if you were to ask a question at the moment, you know, when does something, when does something that's epidemic, like people have been talking about the epidemic of diabetes in, in the United States for, for years, when does it become endemic? And that's actually a, a good question. Um, so let me tell you that this is uh, an article, Endemic or Epidemic, Measures of the Endemicity Index of Diabetes. And these authors, this is Indian Journal of Endocrinology, Meta Endocrinology and Metabolism uh, from 2015. The terms endemic and epidemic were coined by Hipp Hippocrates who distinguished between diseases that were always present in a given population and diseases which used to occur during certain periods of a year or during certain years. These terms have now become an integral part of medical etymology. Predominantly used to describe acute infectious diseases, the term epidemic is increasingly being utilized to describe the increasing prevalence of non-infectious metabolic or chronic diseases. This paper, which I'm referring to their paper, tries to discuss the relevance and accuracy of these terms and proposes that certain conditions like diabetes can now be termed an endemic. So the whole question of when does an epidemic become endemic, they try to address. And it's a, it's a, reason, it's a reasonable article if you really want to pursue it. It's endemic or epidemic, measuring the endemicity index of diabetes by Kalra et al. 2015, Indian Journal of Endocrinology and Metabolism. Back to our slides. Who is affected? Some common, but certainly not all, these are just a few of the common personal characteristics that are examined with respect to disease occurrence. Populations. Obviously, when we look at personal characteristics, we need to consider the larger population. Epidemiology is a population-based science. And uh, uh, a little to distinguish here, population with a permanent membership is referred to as a fixed or closed cohort. For example, the nurse's health study. If you're in, you're in. And you're followed and over time the population gets smaller and smaller as nurses drop out or pass away. Um, populations with transient membership is referred to a dynamic population. So the population of Omaha, Nebraska, it can stay the same population forever. People leave, new people can come in. It can grow. The nurses' health study can't grow at this point, but a dynamic population can grow. When does it occur? 
This is just a, a, a diagram of annual plague deaths in London. And you can see the plague comes in and out over this 60-year period, um, which, of course, brings up the, the issue of, uh, you know, is a disease rare? What's a rare disease? Well, sometimes it's rare, sometimes it isn't. In some communities, a certain disease is rare, like rabies, and in others, it's not. So rare is not an absolute term. So what is a rare or sporadic disease? Depends is the answer. There have been definitions like the United States uh, has to, you know, had a D Rare Disease Act which said 200,000 or less, two, less than 200,000 cases in the United States is a rare disease. It's arbitrary though. So where does it occur? Here's the famous cholera cases in, in London and of course the cases uh, were uh, surrounding the Broad Street pump and ultimately the Broad Street pump was was determined to be the culprit so that's a that's a story you shouldn't miss if you if you don't know it measures of morbidity so four simple mathematical parameters counts ratios proportions and rates a count is very simple how many people are in this webinar there's a count somewhere. I don't see it, but there's a count somewhere. And it doesn't matter, of course. I'm happy to have one or more of you. But um, it's a very simple measure. It expresses integ integers, answers the question, how many people have this or how many people have that. It's important to distinguish incident and prevalent, which we'll talk about. How many people get the disease, incidence. How many people have the disease, prevalence. But we'll talk about incidence and prevalence a little more. So here's a count. Deaths in the United States in the 20th century going from 1900 to 2000. And that's a simple count. And of course it looks like it's, the United States has gotten much more dangerous in the past 100 years. But there's something missing, obviously. This is why counts are not the be-all and end-all of, of any sort of uh, health-related science. And what's missing? Of course, the, the, the denominator. The count is a numerator in, in understanding how, what percentage of the population is dying. So we're missing the, the, the denominator. And that's the number of, of course, the number of deaths are going to increase if the number of people increases. So that's why we start getting into more complex measures like ratios. One number divided by another number is a ratio. And a ratio ranges from zero to infinity. Of course, if y is 0 and x is positive, it's infinity. If x is 0 and y is positive, it's 0. So they can be related or completely independent, like the sex of children or people, you know, the sex of people attending a clinic. So the number of females divided by the number of males is a simple ratio. Uh, here's another example. Obtained by dividing one quantity by another. So the number of stillbirths per thousand live births. So here we have 20 stillbirths for every 1,000 live births. Now, why do we multiply by 1,000? Well, we do that in epidemiology. We multiply by some number. If it's a percent, we multiply by 100, and only 100. Because you're not going to have more than 100% or less than 0%. But for something like this, you can say 20 stillbirths for every 1,000 live births. You can say 200 stillbirths for every 10,000 live births. Because if you don't times by 1,000, what do you have? You have 0 0.02 stillbirths for every one live birth. And that's just sort of a, a weird number. It doesn't, doesn't resonate, 0 0.02 stillbirths. So that's why we multiply by 1,000. <coughs> so here I want to point out the difference between a ratio and a proportion, which a proportion is a type of ratio, but it's a special type of ratio. It's a percentage. You don't have a percentage in males over females, but you do have a percentage in what percent of females are in the audience, for example. Now that is a ratio because the most you can have is 100% females or 0% females. So that's a proportion. So the not, the, here the difference is the numerator is included in the denominator. So the denominator includes females here, while in females divided by males, obviously it doesn't.
So that's what a proportion is, a ratio in which the numerator is included in the denominator, and it only ranges from 0 to 1, or if you multiply by 100, by 0% to 100%. And it's, obviously, it's often presented as a percentage. So here, remember we had 2,500 stillbirths. Now we have to include the 50 stillbirths in the total. I mean, so we had 2,500 live births. So now it's 50 stillbirths to 2,550 total births. And now we can do, now it's a proportion. Now the numerator is included in the denominator, and we can do a percent, and it's almost 2%. It's 1.96% of all births are stillbirths. So that's a proportion. And we call this in epidemiology a risk. What's the risk of having a stillbirth? So the term risk comes from, from this, it's a proportion, it's a percent. Your risk is 100%, your risk is 0%. So the risk we formally define as, in this case, as the number of new onset of cases, not existing cases, but new onset of cases, over the population at risk at the beginning of follow-up. So here's a cohort follow-up. I hope it's not too simplistic, but it really does show a cohort of five people who are being followed by you and me for the course of one year, 12 months. And you see that one person out of five got the outcome, let's say the flu. So what is the risk of getting the flu based on our data here? It's one new case divided by five people who are being followed is one over five is 20% risk. In this case, is 20% risk. Here's another example. Following 2,000 newborns, 50 get the outcome. The risk is 2.5%. One out of 40 or 2.5%. So this is something to look over later. It's the same example that I just gave you, but it's a, it's, it's, it's uh, maybe a little more complicated, but not really. Can we assume that this risk applies to other populations? Okay, this population, we need to specify the population. This is the risk in one country. Does it apply to another country? No, it doesn't. If it's a risk in one time period, for example, in this country 50 years ago, does it apply to this country now? No, it is not independent of time. It is not ind independent of place. It's very important to realize that. Also, what if this was 2,000 newborns from a special group of people? No. Would it be the same as another different, completely different group of people? Even though it's in the same time and place, of course it's not the same. So these are not independent of time, place, or population. So you must specify the time period of observation. And you must specify the population. And you must specify the region when you're talking about risk. Now, risk and rate, they get confused sometimes. What is a risk? What is a rate? Some people talk about the death rate, and they're really talking about a risk. Some people talk about a birth rate, and they're really talking about a risk. So it's important to not treat them as exactly the same term. Generally speaking, a rate is a quantity per unit of time. So I'm going to give you some example of rates, because in each case, the denominator is a unit of time. The woman's heart rate was 60 beats per minute. The driver's rate of speed was 60 miles per hour. The man's pay rate was $60 per day. So they all have time in the denominator, and none of them, as you will see, are, are a proportion. The numerator is not included in the denominator. So here's some fancy, uh, fancy footwork. Can we? This can be expressed as a over t, where a is the cases, new cases, always new cases, and t is a component of time. And this range is not a percent. It's not zero to a, to one. It's zero to infinity. Measures speed at which things happen. It's 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 more precise in terms of incorporating time than a risk, but it's not as intuitive as a risk. When you, when you, if you were to go to the doctor and said, what's my, what's my rate of getting this outcome? Uh, that's not very intuitive for you or the doctor, even if he knew the answer. 
or she. I'm not sexist. So he or she knew the answer. If, um, on the other hand, you said, what's my risk of getting this outcome? And they said 30% or 20% or whatever. That would be more intuitive. So rate is more precise in terms of time. Risk is more intuitive in terms of personal risk. So here's a formula for incidence rate in epidemiology. The number of new cases of disease during a certain follow-up time and divided by the number of person time units of observation. So in that earlier example where we had, oh, let's see if I, sorry, I need to go back to it. I told you the risk here. We calculated the risk together, one over five. But what's the rate? We can't say one over five. Here you need to calculate the actual person time. The numerator is the same. It's still it's like a risk. It's the number of new cases. And here we only have one new cases. But now we're not counting the number of people. We're counting, we're counting the person time. So person one was in the study without having an outcome for 12 months. That counts as 12 months person time. Person two was only in the study for six months before having the outcome. At that point, they're not at risk of being another new case. So they only contribute six months. And three, four, and five each contribute 12 months. So it's basically, it's exactly four and a half years. So it's one case divided by four and a half years person time. Now let's skip forward back to where we were. And here's how we calculated that. It's one divided by 4.5 person years is 0 0.22 cases per person per year. Or, if that's not intuitive, we can, we can say 2.2. We can multiply it by 10 and say 2.2 cases per 10 person years or 22 cases per 100 person years. Whatever, whatever is most intuitive, that's how I would calculate it. <coughs> and you could, you know, this is an example of Parkinson's disease. I don't know if we have the number example here, but... Um, it's the way you would, do, you would look at new cases of Parkinson's disease divided by the total number of years people were disease-free under observation at risk for that outcome. Um, this slide is mainly to emphasize again that we included the place, which is Knox County, the population Knox County, um, we included the uh, specifics, like uh, are they residents over, these are residents over 30 years of age. So we have the time per year, we have the place, Knox County, we have the population, people over 30 years of age. That's just something that we remember all the time. Incidence rate, as I said, measures how rapidly new cases develop. New cases per person time. There are synonyms, incidence. People will just talk about incidence or incidence density or rate, or hazard. Number of new cases divided by the person. I know I'm repeating that, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's worth repeating, and it's not, it's not difficult once you give it some thought. Person time accounts for all the time each person is in the population at risk. The length of time for each person is called person time. And the total time is the sum of person times. It's called a total person time at risk for the population. And that's the numerator for your risk, rate. Sorry, rate. Even I'm getting confused between risk and rate, but um, uh, that's more of a tongue, tongue twister for me. I do know the difference between risk and rate. So 100 persons followed for 10 years is 1,000 person years. Also, 1,000 persons followed for one year is 1,000 person years. And that illustrates the point that the rate that this calculation assumes the rate is constant over different periods of time. If the rate is not constant, then th these are not equivalent suddenly. A hundred person years followed for ten years should be a thousand person years. And it is a thousand person years. But in the calculation, you're assuming that the rate is constant over different periods of time. That's the only way you can have make equivalence between ten years and one year and assume that it's the same rate that you're
So there are assumptions. There are always underlying assumptions. But this is an important one. Just like there are disagreements in epidemiology, like between Ilan Johnson and, and Yen, there are assumptions underlying things that, well, always be aware of that. Because is the assumption being met or not? And, and of course, when we go into the biostatistics realm, and you may be having a talk about biostatistics, it's that underlying assumptions. Always be clear about the underlying assumptions and epidemiology as well. So here's that example again. One new case, 4.5 person years. And if you have any questions about cal calculating person years, it's worth taking a simple example like this. And it's easy to calculate four and a half years of, ob of time that the entire group of people were at risk for getting the outcome. And during that time, one person got the outcome. And by the way, we can, just like we did with one year versus 10 years, we could do it in terms of person months or person days. So they're, they're equivalent as long as you make sure that um, your numerator and denominator are, are treated the same way. You know? So here, if we wanted to, do, uh, to go to person months, we divide by 12. Um, let's see, this is, can we calculate a rate? Yeah, okay. So I'm bringing an example that we used before to calculate a risk, 2.5%. From this information, can we calculate a rate? It's a yes or no answer. Can we calculate a rate? What's missing? If the answer is no, what's missing? If you say no, that's the correct answer. Because what we're missing is we don't know the person time here. So this is not a case where we can develop. We don't know when those 50 people got the outcome. If they all got it at day one of follow-up, they contribute pretty much nothing to the total person time. If they all got it on the last day, that's an extra 50 years of person time. So uh, we're missing a little bit of information about when events occurred, and we're not able to calculate a rate precisely yet. This person, person number two, counted six months because they got the outcome after six months. What if they got the outcome after one month? They would only be able to count one month of person time, or 11 months. Now the risk, you'll see the risk doesn't, doesn't change. Doesn't care when that person got their outcome. It's still going to be one divided by five, but the rate does care when they got the outcome. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a cough. I uh, apologize if I cough. I haven't been able to shake it yet. But now we're going into another measure of prevalence. This is the last one. We went through count, rate, and risk, and now we're going to prevalence. What is a prevalence? It's a proportion, like a risk. It's not a rate. There's no time component. Measures proportion of existing diseases or disease in the population at a given time. It's a snapshot. It's dimensionless, positive number, zero to one. It can also be expressed as a percentage. What percentage of people in my town have diabetes currently? We're not looking at when they got them or what new or how often it occurs or what, how many new cases we're going to get in the next year. That's, we'll leave that to risk and rate. This is how many people exist right now in my town with the outcome. If my town has 100 people and 30 people have a, a given disease like diabetes, what's the prevalence? Is 30 divided by 100 or 0 0.3? Multiply that by 100 to get a percentage, 30%. 30% prevalence. OK, so prevalence, A over N, where A is the number of existing cases, N is the total population. And N can be divided into number of existing cases plus number of non-cases. So it's the total population, obviously. So back to our example. What's the prevalence of this particular, let's say this is not a fatal disease. Person number two who gets di is diagnosed with diabetes after six months and for the next six months of this study has diabetes. <coughs> 
what's the prevalence of diabetes at the beginning of the study? If you said zero percent, zero prevalence, that is correct. At six months, the prevalence becomes 20 percent. So it's time dependent in a way, but it's not a rate. Now, I mentioned earlier an uh, argument between Ilan Johnson and Yetnin about whether prevalence was a rate. And Ilan Johnson cogently argued that, you know, there's no time component. And Yetnin came back with, well, um, there is a time component because in order to uh, determine prevalence, you need to, you know, you're not going to get all the information at once. You need to uh, sweep, as you would, as you will, over, over the population to get that. Anyway, it was the, it was a fantastic argument, and uh, doesn't matter who won because maybe nobody won. But in my mind, prevalence is not a not a rate, and in Yetman's mind, it is. Um, but we're going to give you a little quiz in a second: um, incidence versus prevalence, new disease versus existing disease. Now, there are different implications for incidence and prevalence in study design, analysis, and interpretation. So it's important to get these two concepts straight. For each of the following, determine whether this statement requires measurement of incidence or prevalence. The Department of Education wants to organize an after-school program for children with learning disabilities and needs to know if there are sufficient children in need within the county to warrant such a service. If you're a director of, of county services, do you want to organize an after-school program? If one person shows up, what about if a thousand people show? I mean, you need to know how many people exist with this condition at this time. So if you said prevalence, you're correct. The University Hospital, this is another example. If you have a question about this, please ask. And I'll, I haven't really looked at the question box yet, but I will shortly. The University Hospital epidemiologist wants to know the rate of tuberculin skin test conversion, that is going from negative to positive indicates an infection with the causative agent of tuberculosis occurring in third-year medical students during 2001. So it's tricky, it's a little trickier than the last one because you can say, well, we're looking to see what the prevalence or how many people actually have tuberculosis at this time. Yes, that's a prevalence. But we are looking for skin test conversion. The outcome is not whether you have the uh, condition of tuberculosis is whether your skin test converts from negative to positive. So it's a little tricky, but if you narrow your focus on that, the correct answer, I believe, is incidence. Again, if you have a question, let me know. Here's the last example. A medical, a medical school research team has developed a new drug which is purported to cure chronic schizophrenia and the team wants to study a large number of patients to determine the efficacy of the drug. Incidence or prevalence? All right, well, first of all, if you think about it for a second, you're looking for a cure. With people who are not cured, you are now following them up for some sort of cure. You've given them an exposure, a drug, and you're following them up for a cure. It doesn't make sense that you're looking for an existing cure, because that doesn't make sense. They wouldn't be um, a group of people with the condition. So you are looking for a new cure. It's, it's obviously not an existing cure. That doesn't make sense. You're looking for a new cure. Some people may be confused because, well, well I, I, it's worded this way to confuse you so that you can sort this out. Chronic schizophrenia, it sounds like some sort of prevalence of people with this condition, but no, we are looking at the cure. So it's important to focus on what you're looking at and realize the difference between incidence and prevalence. And finally, this is my last point on insolence and, and, and incidence and prevalence, and that is that the number that prevalence is a, is a product of incidence and you know of input and output. New cases are bringing the disease into our population. That's how the disease, that's how people with the, the disease existing got here. They were new cases at one point. So that's your input. 
your output is whether people are cured or whether they die from the disease. Whether they're cured or whether they, they die from the disease, they're no longer in the population. So it's a, the prevalence is a product of incidence and, and duration, basically, how long you have the disease. So here's a, another tr sort of tricky question. If the prevalence of people with AIDS in this country has risen over the past 10 years, is that necessarily a bad sign regarding public health progress? So if the prevalence of AIDS, and that you see the prevalence is the round part, well, you would think yes, but not necessarily. The incidence could not have, it could have actually gone down. But if the death rate or cure, or if the death rate goes, to, you know, goes down even more, then the prevalence is going to increase. So sometimes an increase in prevalence does not mean that more people are getting the disease. It could simply mean that more people are living with the disease. We found a way to stop people from dying from AIDS. So in this case, the increase in prevalence is not necessarily a bad sign regarding public health problems. Of course, we want to prevent incidents. Of course, we want to stop incidents. But sometimes an increase in prevalence means that we made a gain in terms of allowing people to live with the condition. So prevalence is a, is a, is a product of incidence and duration. Measures of mortality, very, very similar. I was talking about incidence of disease. You can treat mortality as an outcome, okay? except mortality, the only difference is you're not going to have, you can have a mortality rate, you can have a mortality risk, but you're not going to have a, 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 a prevalence. You know, what's the prevalence of, of, of people who have died? That doesn't make sense anymore. So risk and rate of death, very similar. Same calculations. Same, it's just another outcome. But obviously, prevalence doesn't make sense. A few final points which you should know case fatality rate, it's called a rate, but it's not a rate. It's a proportion. So it's a number of deaths from an illness divided by the number of people with that illness. What percentage of people diagnosed as having a disease die within a certain time after diagnosis? If there's a very uh, uh, a disease that's very uh, uh, damaging and we don't have a cure for it, the case fatality rate goes up, like AIDS in the early, early 80s and, and, and uh, mid-80s case fatality rate goes down once we develop ways of, of treating it. Like AIDS today, case fatality rate has gone down. Again, I use the rate cautiously. It's, it's, it's more of a, of, of a thing that you hear by sort of tradition to call it a rate, but technically speaking, as you now know, it's not a rate. It's not a time component. Um, so yeah, we already talked about this. Proportion of mortality of all deaths, the proportion caused by a certain disease. So it's not the it's not the denominator is not people with the disease. It's people the whole community. What's the proportion of mortality from AIDS in a prison population? Very very high at one point. Now it's much lower. Can determine the leading cause of death. Proportion of cause specific death is dependent on all other causes of death. So that's not what the case fatality rate here. If there's a much higher proportion of people who die from something else, it lowers the proportion of mortality from, for AIDS, for example. So it does not tell us the risk of dying from AIDS. Here's an example. One of every four deaths in the United States is due to cancer. So what's the proportion of mortality? One of four or 25%. So this crude, you know, speaking about mortality rates, crude mortality rate, that includes all deaths, total population in a time period. Cause-specific mortality includes deaths from a specific cause. For example, what's the cause-specific mortality rate for AIDS? The crude, all mortality, and AIDS-specific. You may hear that term, or you know, quite often you're going to hear that term. Includes all deaths in a specific age group over a certain time period. So what's the age specific mortality from uh, flu does it vary but you know if you're if you're what's the age specific rate for very young children for middle-aged 
adults, for elderly adults. Obviously, it, it, it's, it's higher for elderly and, and young children. Age adjustment. Since we do have different age specific rates of disease, Here's a question, should I move from Florida to Alaska? Because the crude mortality rate in Alaska looks to be about one-third the crude mortality rate in Florida. Florida is about over 1,000 per 100,000 per year. It's 387 per 100,000 per year in Alaska. I mean, you'd think that you should get in your car if you're living in Florida and just drive across the country and through Canada and, and live, in, live in Alaska. But it's not that simple. If you know what's going on here, what's what's specific about uh, Alaska and 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 uh, Florida? Well, if if a lot of lot of retired people, the age population structure is different. A lot of older people in Florida, then it makes sense suddenly. So we do a little adjustment. I'm not gonna. This is the kind of thing where I I think some of you will have your eyes glaze over and oh numbers, lots of numbers. But the, the point here, and you can go over this later, is that we're just looking at crude. We're not looking at, this is how we get the crude. We're not looking at age-specific rates. We're just looking at the totals. That's how we get the crude. And that's misleading. Can we remove this confounding by age? And we'll talk about confounding later. Yeah, we can separate the population, it's called stratify, into age groups and calculate rates for each age. And then we can say, okay, now you guys are very different population structure. Let's standardize. Let's give you the same population structure and apply your specific rates to that standard population. So what you do in a case was called direct standardization. What you do in a case like this is normally you say, okay, we're going to give everybody the population structure of the United States as a whole. Every state's going to going to be given that, and we're going to apply the state's age-specific rates to the U.S. population as a whole. And now we're dealing with those individual rates. Again, I shouldn't dwell on this, and I don't want you to worry too much, but ultimately, if, there, if we actually can look at this and, and make them equal, artificially, of course, because Alaska is still a younger population than Florida. But if we equalize them artificially and apply their rates, suddenly it's a little better in Florida. Yeah, it's, it's similar, but you're going to have to turn your car around now. You're on your way to Alaska, and now you're halfway through Canada. You really ought to turn your car around, because once we look at the age adjusted, Florida is actually a little bit better. So you can look at that later. Indirect standardization is less common. This is when age-specific rates are not available. You use age-specific mortality rates from the general population to calculate an expected number of deaths in your population, otherwise known as the standardized mortality ratio. I don't think this is going to be emphasized on your exam, but I don't, you know, I don't, um, as I said, I don't know. I, I shouldn't know. I don't know. But my point is, is this is something you only should worry about, most of you, just to understand why we do it. And don't worry about the calculations. And that's just my advice, and it may, it may turn out to be good or bad, but that's my advice. Is don't worry so much about how to do this right now. Worry about why you do this and what it means, and that's really the most important thing. And certainly, even if you want to play with the numbers, it's first important to know. It's always important to know why, we do, you know, why we're doing it. So we're going to take a little break, and, and, and uh, if the organizers don't mind, it may be more than one break. We may take a break every, every hour or so, so there may be another break coming up. But I, th I thought this would be a good time to have a five-minute break. It's now 1.46. Um, 1.46, exactly, on the East Coast, and I wanted to give you a five-minute break, and so we'll come back at 1.51 on uh, Eastern Time, 1.51, five minutes. See you in five minutes. <laughs>
Okay, I'm back. I did not mute my line, so I'm assuming that you can hear me. And I'm assuming if you can't, the organizers will let me know. So now we are going to talk about study design. And we're going to start with the most intuitive. We're going to talk about experimental studies, clinical trial, randomized control trial. Now we're going to talk about some observational studies. And we're going to define what makes them observational as opposed to experimental. Um, I, th I think that the experiment is the most intuitive. Uh, we don't, <coughs> epidemiology doesn't always start, uh, if you take a class, you may or may not start with experimental studies, but I find them the most intuitive. Um, for example, when I was a kid and I was arguing with my friend about which way takes longer or shorter to get home from where we were, we might invent a little solution to that problem. I might say, okay, you're going that way, and I'm going my way, and whoever gets there first not only wins, but I prove my hypothesis that my way is shorter. And that is an experiment. Um, and it, I, I believe it's a very intuitive, uh, intuitive uh, epidemiologic uh, approach is to see if we can do an experiment. I think it's something we can all relate to. What makes it experimental is we manipulate the exposure. For example, you take this drug and you, this other person, you take that drug. That's like which way is shorter to go home, which drug works better. That's the researcher manipulating the exposure. That's experimental. A randomized control trial is a type of experimental research designed for comparing different treatments in which the assignment of treatments to patients is made by a random mechanism. Are all trials randomized? No. They can be randomized, they may not be randomized. It depends on what the design of the study is. Customary to present table, it's, it's, but you know, when you do randomize, and this is where my second bullet point comes in, if you do randomize, uh, it's important to know that it's not a guarantee. The, the, the whole point is to equalize groups. The whole point is to equalize groups. Imagine the problem we just had about where to live for, for the best mortality outcome. Alaska or, or Florida, I mean, the best thing would be to do, to do would, if we really had to know, <laughs> is to take all the Alaskans and Flor Floridians and put them in a pool and randomly assign them to live in Alaska or Florida. I know that's not going to go over very well, but that would be a way to do that. Um, but when you randomize, when you randomize, sometimes, like if you flip a coin, you know, the idea is to get people distributed, whether it's smoking or non-smoking. You know, you want an equal number of smokers and non-smokers in both groups, but there's no guarantee. And that's why it's customary to present a table of patient characteristics to show that the randomization resulted in a balance in patient characteristics. Because you can flip a coin and you should get five heads and five tails, but there's no guarantee that you won't get ten heads. So that's why we check to make sure our randomization worked. Here's the outline, here's the basic outline, and it's important to note the time. We're looking at the right side of this slide, you'll see the time. I mean, sometimes the diagrams are where time goes ac across the, the, the x-axis, like we did with our study that we illustrated with rates and, and risks. Here the time is, is pointing downward. So we start with a study population. We randomly assign them to two or more outcomes. The diagram simply shows two, but there's more. And then you look to see if people improved more with one treatment or one exposure compared to another. So here's something I took from the literature from uh, PubMed, it's an abstract, a piece of an abstract, and I would say, what type of study is this? And you may say it's not fair because I haven't studied study design enough, but yeah, just read it. Fifteen patients were randomized to receive a preoperative beverage with high 
or low carbohydrate content. And we look for some outcome. And you can say to yourself, wow, it's, it's a follow-up. In other words, we're starting with an exposure and we're looking forward in time for an outcome. Very important. This time thing is very important. We're looking forward in time. After exposure, we're looking forward in time for an outcome. First exposure, then outcome. Because it's randomized, because we decided who's getting this, this treatment and which treatment, it is a clinical trial. It's a randomized clinical trial. Here's another example, also from the literature. 98 individuals, 80, 18 to 65 years of age, were randomized to placebo or sertraline for two days, followed by 50 milligrams from et cetera, et cetera. OK, it doesn't say what the outcome is, but sertraline is otherwise known as Zoloft. I'd imagine the outcome is depression, whether someone is depressed or not. So again, we're starting with an exposure. We're manipulating the exposure, and we're looking to see what happens. And they were randomized. It is a randomized clinical trial. Okay. Some limitations of a clinical trial. Ethical. Can you randomize someone to drink alcohol? Can you randomize someone to smoke cigarettes? Um, can you randomize somebody to have some uh, damage done to them in some way that you can see the outcome? No, no, and no. Another thing is a select population. It may not apply. This is what we call generalizability. It may not apply to another population. Um, you know, people who volunteer, either because they, they meet certain conditions or because they volunteer, could be different from people who don't meet those conditions and or don't volunteer. So the duration of a clinical trial, they're very expensive. It's very difficult already to get people to be in one. If it goes on for a long time, usually people drop out, usually people, and it's very, very expensive. So if it's a disease that takes a long time to develop or a long time to cure, clinical trial may not be the best design. And finally, like I said, adherence and compliance. People only, even for short duration, you'll find that people decide they don't like the side effects of a particular drug or they don't like the effort of not, even if it's randomized to not eating as much. You know, some people are just like, ah, oh, forget it. I've seen people in studies like that. They're caught, you know, at midnight, someone, some researcher sees them in the, in the pizzeria, you know, ordering three large pizzas for themselves. So um, adherence becomes very difficult in the clinical trial, something that needs to be monitored and considered constantly. I'm sure you've heard of blinding. You know, it's a blinded study. Important when knowing treatment could influence the interpretation of the results. You know, that the researcher shouldn't know because they might, they might want their drug to work so badly that they're going to uh, look hard to, to make sure that it does, consciously or unconsciously. And, and a patient also, they know they're getting the, the real treatment. Um, placebo ensures the controls and treatment groups have the same experience. Now, sometimes it's not possible. If you have, for example, I've seen uh, placebo, uh, you know, randomized control trials of fish oil. And inevitably someone, and, and you know, and the, and the, the uh, placebo's olive oil, but inevitably someone's like, I wonder what I'm getting. They open up the capsule and they take a, a whiff. And you know, fish oil and olive oil don't smell the same. So blinding doesn't always work. Um, single blind patient does not know, double blind patient and investigator. And double blind is really the standard. It's really the standard. It all comes down to obtaining groups that are comparable for everything except the treatment so that differences in outcome can fairly be ascribed only to the difference between the groups, in other words, to the treatment. A clinical trial can be viewed as a, as a type of prospective cohort study, which we'll talk about next. It involves active follow-up of a group of people and determines their outcomes. Again, exposure. Follow them up to see what happens. That forward directionality is very important. Makes it a cohort study. It's a forward directionality. It's intuitive. We start with an exposure, and we go forward in time and see what happens. So we record the exposure before we, we record the outcome, and we look to see what happens. That is a cohort design. It's prospective in nature. 
you would say it has a forward directionality because imagine yourself looking at the at the study in a diagram you'd be stand what's your reference point you stand on the exposure you look forward in time to the outcome and that's a the forward directionality that's where i'm starting and where i'm looking i'm starting with exposure i'm looking forward in time for the outcomes to see what happens forward directionality and here's a cohort study and it's an observational study because we are observing who's exposed and who isn't that's why it's observational let's say this is a prospective cohort study of smoking so E positive exposure positive they're the smokers E negative they're the non-smokers did we say you smoke and you don't no that's not ethical but of course some people do smoke some people don't smoke we observe so a, a clinical trial is a type of cohort study where the exposure is manipulated. But the same forward directionality. Do you see time on the bottom? Do you see the onset of the study? Do you see the, that everything that we're looking for in terms of outcome and what we're looking for comes after the exposure? It comes after, you know, it's process forward directionality. This is forward, this is one that you saw earlier. It's a forward directionality. We're starting at the beginning when nobody has the outcome. We're following them up. So the rates that we calculated based on this diagram, the risk that we calculated based on this diagram, it's part of a cohort study. It's got a forward directionality. And, you, and that's important because remember we talked about incidents, new cases of disease? that's where you get them in a forward directionality in the study that has forward directionality so we found a new case after six months if we were not following that person we would not have found that new case that's a forward directionality cohort study here's another example it's a little more complex but now we've got two groups of people not just one now we have exposed and unexposed. Now we can calculate the risk in the exposed. We can also calculate the risk in the unexposed. So there are four exposed people being followed, and there are four unexposed people being followed. And you're going to calculate the, the, the risk in the exposed and the risk in the unexposed, because that leads us to a very important uh, measure in epidemiology. It's called the risk ratio. It's the ratio of the exposed, the risk in the exposed versus the risk in the unexposed. So let's calculate the risk in the exposed. We had started out with four people. That's our cohort. Half of them, two of them, got the outcome. So the risk in the exposed, let's say it's a, a risk of a certain type of disease in smokers. That's our exposure. It's 50%. It's only 25% in the unexposed. If we take the ratio of 50%, to 25%, we get a risk ratio of 2. And we'll talk a little bit more about risk ratios, but a risk ratio of 2 means that it's twice as likely. Your risk is double if you're exposed than if you're not exposed. Now, what if they're both equal? What if we only had one? Well, if they're both equal, if it's 25% divided by 25%, it's a risk ratio of 1. And you and a risk ratio of one means there's no association. So that's what we're going to talk about in, 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 in upcoming slides. Interpreting risk ratio. The risk ratio of one, no association. The risk ratio above one, the exposure increases your risk of disease. A risk ratio below one, and it can go all the way down to zero, it means that the exposure prevents or tends to, it's inversely related. So cohort studies, groups defined on the basis of some characteristic. Just a second ago, we had smokers and non-smokers, exposed and non-exposed, are prospectively followed to see whether an outcome of interest occurs. Forward directionality. We have a comparison. We compare the proportion of persons with the disease in the exposed group to the proportion with the disease in the unexposed group. That's what we did. We did. We could do. We could have just as easily calculated rates, but we calculated risks and we came up with a risk ratio. That's exactly what we did. 
If the exposure is associated with the disease, we expect the proportion of persons with the disease in the exposed group or rate will be greater than the proportion with the disease in the unexposed group. And that's what we saw with this previous example. We saw the exposed group did have a higher risk of disease. Not that we're going to calculate rate here because we don't have uh, any time reference, but the rate would be higher as well. So here's a diagram. Uh, I left out the time arrow. Where would you put it? Well, you'd put it going down in this case, starting with exposed, looking forward in time, forward directionality for disease. There we go. There's, there is the time bar on the left. Um, there is something called a retrospective, or I like to call historical cohort study. And that's, that's all done by historical records. Like if you went and found records of um, Civil War, people who joined up in the Civil War, and then later found records of who uh, was killed in the Civil War, you would be able to get a, a death rate or a, or, a, or a risk of death by being in this group versus that group. And it could all be done with records. But the important thing here is that it's still a forward directionality. You're still starting with the records of people who were exposed first and then looking in time, even though you're doing this retro retroactively, you are still looking forward in time from the point that they joined the army to the point that they were, they were killed in battle. Prospective cohort studies define sample, a sample free of the disease outcome of interest, very important, and then follow them up. So if you are already have the flu, would you be eligible or should you be eligible for a cohort study that is looking to see whether certain behaviors that you know, certain advice will lead to having less flu? You, you can't. You can't be in that cohort study because you already have the outcome. So measure of proportion, uh, you know, we're looking at uh, uh, risks or rates. So measure the proportion of outcome between the exposed and unexposed, or a rate. You'll get a rate ratio if you do. With a retrospective or a historical cohort study, um, you, um, yeah, I mean, there, there are some disadvantages in terms of, of if, you, if there's a new drug on the market, if we're looking at a new drug on the market, we want to know if it's safe. You know, people have been taking this new new drug. You're not going to be able to do a, a historical cohort study. Yeah, it's, it would be great if you could, in a sense, if you could get all the information. It's certainly cheaper to go through records than to follow people for years and hire people to follow people for years. But you're not going to have information on something that was just started recently. You're not going to be able to do it. But on the other hand, let's say that you have a drug like... Uh, Biox or something that's been banned and it's not been on the market, but you have a hypothesis and you want to look at, you'd have to do a historical cohort study. You simply couldn't start with people now using a, you know, who are, who are using a banned drug. It, it, you can't do that. So there are places where you do want to do a retrospective or a historical cohort study where it's the only design that you can use. Now, some strengths of the cohort study, you know, it may be used to define incidents and look at the natural history. What happens after we give this drug? What happens over the course of time regarding the cure or the outcome? You know the temporal sequence. In other words, we know that exposure came first. We know that the, the disease itself didn't change this value, this blood level, uh, or this, this behavior. We know that the behavior came first. And it's important if we want to say this behavior leads to this outcome, smoking leads to this outcome, we need to know. And a cohort study is the best design for making sure that the exposure really did come before the outcome. If you have a rare exposure, the cohort study is, is strong in the sense that, uh, let's say you want to look at, well, you believe that people exposed to a certain chemical who work in a rubber, rubber manufacturing, um, and, and you feel that there's a risk involved. 
well, with a, with a cohort design, you can simply say, I'm going to enroll people as my exposed group from various rubber manufacturing plants. And as a control group, I'm going to, or as a, as a non-exposed group, I'm, I'm going to look at people who work for a, in a similar industry that doesn't use rubber. But the point is that collecting exposures is easy in this case compared to the design we're going to talk about later, the case, the case control study. In this case, you can go out and seek exposure. You can narrow your focus on certain people who work in certain industries. And another advantage, you can look at many outcomes. We can look at, uh, for example, smoking. We could look at lung cancer. That's our outcome. Then another person can come along and say, well, I want to look at heart disease. Well, sure. We were following them forward. We know what happened to them. You can look at heart disease. Someone else says, I want to look at thyroid cancer. I want to look at smoking and thyroid. I want to look at smoking and multiple sclerosis. Sure, sure. Multiple exposures. You can also look at uh, other things. If, you, if, if lung cancer is your outcome, you can say, sure, I can look at smoking. But also we have collected information about radon exposure. It goes on and on. These are advantages of a cohort study. But they do have limitations. They're expensive. It could take a very long time to find an answer. For example, smoking and cancer. Smoking and colon cancer could take 40 years. That is the, that is the latency time of smoking and, and, and colorectal cancer, 30, 40 years. Associations may be due to confounding. That, but that's true with any observational study because we didn't randomize. We couldn't randomize. We'll talk more about confounding later. Exposures assess that baseline may be incomplete. What if you did a, collected every factor that you think that might be related to some outcome, but then you see, you read a hypothesis that says, well, did you collect information on sleep habits? Oh, no. I forgot to collect information on sleep habits. So now, oh no, what am I going to do now? I've been following people for 20 years and I don't have information on sleep habits. Diseases with long preclinical phase may not be detected. In other words, people may, may already have the disease, but we think they don't have the, the disease. So people who shouldn't be in the cohort study are in the cohort study. And sometimes you deal with that by any cases that occur within the first year may be excluded, for example because it suggests they really did have a preclinical stage of disease. Sensitive to follow-up bias. What if people, what if people, diseased people, who, you know, people who are, 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 are starting to get the, the disease and also have the exposure, well, they, they leave. They quit. They don't like it. They don't want to be in the study anymore. Well, you can't analyze them. You're not going to be able to analyze their data. They're going to have their disease outside of your observation and you could end up reaching erroneous conclusions. So loss to follow-up is a problem in, in, in cohort studies. So what type of study is this? Again, this is going to be easy. I took it from the literature. Cigarette smoking data were collected on all household members during two private censuses in Washington County, Maryland. These two groups were followed up one from 1963 to 1978, and the other from 1975 to 1994 for first-time diagnosis of rectal cancer. Okay, so what's the directionality? What's the directionality? Are we starting with the, the disease and looking back to see what exposures these diseased and non-diseased people have? No, we are, we are doing a classic cohort approach. We are starting on getting data on exposure and we are following people up and whether it's a historical or a prospective study doesn't matter so much. More important that you know that it's a cohort study. Sometimes it's not always clear. It, it boils down to what the investigator intended to do when they collected the data. More important than whether it's historical or whether it's a, a, a prospective study is that you understand it's a cohort study and that it has a forward directionality. Cohort study. Now I go back here and you're going to say, wait, I saw this already. This is not a cohort study. It's a clinical trial. 
But what I, I brought it up really so that you would understand that they both are a type of cohort study. One is observational and one is an experimental. But they both start with an exposure. They both follow up in time. It's forward directionality and they both look at outcomes. And you can both calculate relative risks or relative rates, rate ratios, risk ratios. So now we're going to talk about case control studies. I mentioned them briefly, but they do not. I'll give you a hint up front. They do not have a forward directionality. They have a backward directionality. So we compare various characteristics, past exposures, for cases to those of controls. So we compare the proportion with the exposure in the cases to the proportion with the exposure in the control group. So let's say we want to study smoking and lung cancer. In this case, we start with a bunch of people who have lung cancer and a group of people who don't have lung cancer. And we ask them, looking back in time, how much cigarette smoking did you do? So what's the directionality there? Where are we starting and where are we looking? Remember that diagram I told you to imagine before, we're stand, where we were standing on the exposure that's where we were starting our, that's where we, that's our reference point. We're looking forward in time to see what happened. Here we have a different reference point because we started collecting cases and controls or people with and without disease. And we asked them, look back in time with me. Tell me what you did. How much did you smoke when you were 30? How much did you smoke when you were 40? What's the directionality there? Imagine yourself standing on the outcome. You're standing on the outcome and you are facing backward in time and you are searching. What are you searching for? Once you start the study, what are you searching for? You're not starting with exposure, searching for outcome. That was prospective. That was forward directional. You are starting from the point of disease and you're comparing them to non-disease people. And what are you searching for? What are you asking for? What are you inquiring for? Information about the past. So backwards directionality. This is a case control study. If the exposure is associated with the disease, we expect that the proportion of persons with the exposure in the case group, the cases will be more exposed to cigarettes, in other words, in the past, if they have lung cancer, compared to the proportion who have the exposure in the control group. So we start with lung cancer cases. We would expect a higher proportion of them would report a history of smoking cigarettes, a history of smoking cigarettes in the past compared with people who do not have lung cancer. So our time bar is, is going from disease forward in time. We're, 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 I'm sorry, we are inquiring backwards in time to find out the exposure. So what's the directionality? It's backwards. Now compared to a cohort study, more efficient for rare diseases. Why? How many people die of arsenic poisoning in the United States every year? Very few, maybe 100 people. Now if you were to do a cohort study, uh, you'd have to enroll the entire 330 million people in the United States uh, you know, 330 million or whatever we have, just to get 100 cases. Uh, I don't think we have the funds or the time for that. Case control study, we can just go and find those 100 cases and compare them to 100 people who are not exposed. We did not have arsenic poison. So here's why it's, it's more uh, efficient for rare diseases, while the cohort study is more efficient for ex uh, rare exposures. Can evaluate multiple exposures. Now, if you have lung cancer, or if you're a control in a lung cancer group, we can ask, did you smoke? But we can also ask, did you um, live in a house with radon? Did you, um, did you eat a lot of fruit and vegetables? Did you, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's less expensive because we're at, you know, asking someone to think back in time is cheaper financially than following them, you know, for 20 years because that takes 20 years. Asking someone what they took 20 years ago, that takes 20 seconds. Well, I'm just joking. It could take longer than 20 seconds to ask a question, but not, not necessarily longer than 
you can get answers more quickly. If a new disease came along, people were suddenly getting disease like eosinophilia myalgia syndrome. Look that up. Early 90s. CDC came in. What's going on? Why are people suddenly getting this horrible, horrible morbidity and even mortality? What's going on? Well, first we identified it. Eosinophilia myalgia syndrome. Then we started asking, not, I didn't do this, but uh, public health officials asking, what did you were exposed to? Well, we were, you know, it turns out they took L-tryptophan, uh, amino acid that helps you sleep, or people think helps you sleep. And then they asked further. They did further case control studies. It was from one producer. And within a year, I believe, or less, they identified the producer. They found a contaminant in the pill, in this batch, in this from this producer. And they closed it down, and the eosinophilia cases went down to zero. Or, you know, the, the outbreak was, was controlled at that point. Now, think about a cohort study, ladies and gentlemen. Think about that. Would you even know to ask the right question? Would you even know how long you needed to follow people up? What if you forgot? What if you didn't ask about l tryptophan You'd be looking for a long time, not finding any. How long is the latency period? No one knows. How long would you have to follow people? No one knows at that point. It would take much longer, and it would be more expensive. And we would not have had the quick important outcome that we did have with eosinophilia myalgia syndrome, EMS, eosinophilia myalgia syndrome. But there are, there are obviously challenges. I mean, who's the best control group? I mean, diff selecting different control groups gives you different answers. How do you know you selected the right one? With a cohort study, you don't worry about that. It's all internal. You don't have a control group per se. It's not a sample. Your, your cohort is your group. In a case control study, you're sampling. And sampling has problems. Challenges retrospective exposure assessment. Okay, how many carrots did you eat in the past year? Well, if you say, I don't know, a lot of other people would say, I don't know either, unless you hate carrots, unless you're allergic to carrots, or unless you're a carrot aficionado and you know exactly how many carrots you ate. So in a cohort study, we can say, all right, how many carrots did you eat today? How many carrots did you, you know, we can, we can monitor your exposure much better. We rely on memory for a case control study often, usually. We rely on the person's memory, which can be faulty. People can also, by the way, <coughs> um, not tell the truth on purpose. So there are, there are, um, there are challenges with case control studies, so much so that if you go to a modern medical school, you'll often hear people totally dismissing the case control study from consideration. First of all, it's not a, for some people, I'm not, I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't stereotype, but for some people, if it's not a clinical trial, it's not a study, which I disagree with. I mean, I, I will just point you to the eosinophilia myalgia syndrome again and say, that's not the only time a case control study has saved lives, and it won't be the last. So be aware of the fact that people put, put these studies into hierarchies of evidence, and I personally am I'm skeptical of, of the value of doing that. I think each study has its own ups and downs, and each study needs to be taken on its own terms. A term, nested case control study. Well, it's a case control study nested in the cohort study. And it, it solves some of the problems of a, of a traditional case control study. I mentioned the nurses' health study, a, a, a cohort study of 100,000 nurses going on for decades out of Harvard. Well, let's say you have um, a particular uh, cancer that you believe is related to a particular protein in the blood. Now, you could do a full cohort approach here. That means thawing out 100,000 bloods, identifying people with that protein and people without the protein, and looking forward in time to see who got the outcome and who didn't, if it's related to that protein. Now, 
you thaw and you use 100,000 bloods, and you may not have, first of all, it's going to cost you zillions of dollars. Second of all, you may not have the bloods for anything else. So many people would recommend, hey, let's do a nested case control approach because it's nested in this, in this nurse's health study. So what do we do? We take 100 people, let's say 100 people got this cancer, and from the remaining people, we'll select, in the cohort, we'll select 100 controls. And we'll thaw 200, so 100 case bloods and 100 control bloods. Now you're only, instead of 100,000, you've got 200, much more manageable. And you also know where your controls came from. So it's a, it's a, it's a really neat approach, the nested case, case control study, but be aware of the fact that most of the case con control studies that you're going to read about are not nested. They're out in the general population, and, and it's much less clear if your control group is representative of the, of the cohorts that gave rise to the cases, so to speak. <coughs> so what type of study is this? It's another quiz. <coughs> Sorry about my cough. Danish women with a first-time multiple sclerosis discharge diagnosis from a neurological department at most 40 years old, in other words, they're, they're 40 years or younger, during the period 98 to 2005, and an age and geographically matched healthy control group. So that's who, who these people were. In other words, women with multiple sclerosis and women from the same area. That's what it means, age and geographically matched. They got people from the same age range and the same area where they lived who did not have MS. Information on number of full-term pregnancies was elicited. One good thing to do in this case is, number one, what's the hypothesis? You read something like this, don't forget about the hypothesis. If you don't get the hypothesis correct, you're not necessarily going to get the study design correct. So the way I read this, the hypothesis is that parity, or the number of pregnancies you have, is related to your risk of multiple sclerosis. So either protective or the more kids you have, the more likely you are to have. One way, it doesn't say, but somehow the number of pregnancies alters your risk of getting MS. Okay? So now that we know that, we know that we're starting with people with the outcome. So now we know the outcome is MS. And we're asking about past history of exposure, which is parity, number of pregnancies. So let's see, hmm, we're starting with a case group and a control group. It's got a backwards directionality. We are starting at disease and we're asking backwards, we're looking backwards to discover the exposure. If you said case control study, you are absolutely correct. So, um, one thing is, and this is, this is important to note, I think we already have, but you are assessing exposure and outcome at the same time. If you're enrolled, you know, we, we discover somebody has a new case of disease, and we enroll them as, as in a case control study as a case, and we ask them their, their exposure history. We're, we're doing that all at once. That's what makes it cheap and convenient. We're not actually going back in time. We're asking them now what they did back in time. Um, yeah, this slide I think we've already talked about. And here's another schematic, another diagram of it. Always know the time bar. We're starting with um, the outcome, and we're looking back. We're determining who was exposed and not. So, you may have a question about case control studies. I didn't want to dwell on it because if you get that book I recommended or already have it or another book like Leon Gordis, he's going to talk more about this. But study design is, is very, very important. Ecological study. Now the unit of observation is the population or community. Up until now, we were looking at actual people. Like we got 36 cases of lung cancer and 27 controls. We got 133 women with MS and 
145 controls. We're looking at individual people, we're getting individual data, and now with an ecological study, we are looking at populations. Now what, I'll explain what I mean, I'll actually show you a diagram. Disease rates and exposures are measured in each of a series of populations. Disease and exposure information may be abstracted from published statistics and therefore does not require expensive or time-consuming data collection. Uh, oh, man, this slide does not work. Um, I'm going to have to go back to that to, to that because um, I think that the cross-sectional study is up there somewhere. But just bear with me. Just bear with me. I was playing with my slides last night. Um, so we're going to stick with ecological studies and then we're going to go back to, to uh, cross-sectional because that's really a hard one to distinguish. So we're going to spend a little bit of time. Measures, so ecological study, and, and by the way, it's sometimes called correlational study and that's not my fault. I would not use the word correlational study because then I think of a cross-sectional study. So I like to call it ecological study, and that's what I will call it. Um, measures that represent characteristics of the entire population. So if I said, instead of saying, instead of counting that person X has this disease, person Y doesn't have this disease um, or this exposure, I'm now looking at, oh, this population has an overall rate of, or this population have, has an overall risk of, see the difference? So here, ah, finally got to the diagram I was looking for. This actually came, this was actually published in a study by, by Michael Hill in the European Journal of Cancer Prevention. So we see cancer rates in a country, this is overall rates of country, by the country. The overall rate of disease, and you, you see this in the news. You say, oh, the rate of cancer in the United States is going down. Well, they're not talking about you personally. They're talking about, well, yes, but they're really talking about the, the country as a whole. And yes, we have an exposure that we're looking at. We're, we're always in epidemiology trying to correlate or relate an exposure to an outcome. But you're probably wondering how we get a national uh, omega-3 fatty intake, intake, acid intake. Well, without interviewing anyone in the country, how do you think we can do that? Well, they've done this. I mean, they did this by data of, they knew how much fish was being consumed. They knew how, I mean, they really got this from long chain omega-3 fatty acid intake. They did it by national fish consumption. So you have national fish consumption statistics versus overall country statistics. And suddenly you see these countries and you say, wow, we have a larger, in USA, we have a higher cancer rate overall, or we have a, a, a lower, we have a lower intake of omega-3 fatty acids. So then you see this curve, and Michael Hill suggested this ecological study suggests or supports the hypothesis that omega-3 fatty acid intake decreases risks of cancer. The problem is, uh, these, this is such a crude analysis that we don't know within any of these countries whether omega-3 fatty acid on a personal level is actually related to cancer risk. There are so many other factors with these countries that, that you, you don't know that. It's called the ecological fallacy. That's why I knew a guy who tried to publish an ecological study. I think he eventually did, but he got a lot of criticism and a lot of rejections. He wanted to show, this is an ecological study, he wanted to show that average sunlight exposure by country was related to average rates of like colon cancer or breast cancer or multiple sclerosis. And he did these ecological studies. So people in Sweden live get less sunlight than people in the United States. And people in the United States get less sunlight, for example, than people living on the equator. And he compared that to, but that doesn't mean, and this is what the criticism was, doesn't mean that within this country, People who are more exposed to sunshine have a lower rate of any disease. It really needs to be looked at within the population and with individuals as the unit of analysis. So directionality. What's the directionality? Because I, I said to be aware of directionality. Cohort, forward directionality, case control, backwards directionality. What is the directionality here? 
It's a quiz. It's a pop quiz. What's the directionality here? Is it forward? Is it backward? It's neither. There's no directionality. It's, it's a slice of time. It's a slice of time. So unit of analysis and directionality will help you in determining study of design. What's the unit of analysis here? It's the only one we're going to talk about that is not individuals. It is populations. The information is a population level with no connection to, to specific individuals. And it's got no directionality. If, if in the future you see a study design and it says, um, and, and you determine by yourself, you say, all right, unit of analysis is a population. It's population level data and there's no directionality. You should think of the ecological study. So we cannot establish causal relationships. You can't control for individual factors that may be confounding. You're unable to link exposures on a population level with an individual level or ecological fallacy. Ecological fallacy, suspected risk factor and disease are associated at the population level but not at the individual level. So here, what type of study is this? Taken right from the literature, PubMed.gov. PubMed During the period 1995 to 2000, 81,132 lung cancer cases were reported in Texas. Research examined the association of metal air releases with the average annual age-adjusted primary and non-small cell lung cancer rates in the 24 Texas counties. Now there's no, you could say yes, the, ultimately individuals gave rise to these data, but they're not being reported and not being studied on an individual level. It is the average annual rates for each county compared with the metal air releases in those counties. Doesn't mean that any individual was exposed. It just said we had this amount of release in this county. We had this overall rate. What type of study is it? No directionality, by the way and unit of analysis is county. It's an ecological study, exactly. Okay, now I need to go back, I'm sorry, but I need to go back and talk about um, cross-sectional studies. And that's where I made my big mistake earlier. I was like, yeah, this is the another diagram. I thought I was giving you another, because I'm going quickly and there's so many slides, but I thought this was another diagram of a case control study, and it's not. I didn't realize I was segueing into cross-sectional studies. So now, let me segue into cross-sectional studies. Um, cross-sectional study. You define a population, you gather data on exposure and disease, and then you try to correlate them. Now, even though there's a time component, it's just a time component that relates to what you're doing physically. Physically, I'm defining a population. Physically, I'm, I'm asking people questions. Physically, I am then doing analyses. But there is no time. There's no directionality. There's time, but there's no directionality. Because look at the part in purple. Look at the part in the middle. And this is sort of with the ecological study as well. You gather data on exposure and disease at the same time existing disease. <clears throat> Another very important point, it's existing disease. I'll do a little cross-sectional study right now. I'll just make one up. We get a bunch of people and we do a study and we say, okay, if you're in a bad mood, raise your hand. So we get the number of people, we, we, we record who has a bad mood. And then we say, okay, if you're wearing bright colored clothing, or dark colored clothing. If you're wearing dark colored clothing, raise your hand. So then I can say, okay, let's now look and see whether wearing dark clothing is correlated with being in a bad mood. It's a slice of time. Am I, am I hypothesizing that if you start with bad or dark clothing, you will get in a bad mood? No, that's prospective. Am I starting by saying, are you in a bad mood? And, and look back in time and saying, you know, what were you thinking when you put on your dark clothing? What were you... No, that's retrospective. That's, that's backwards directional. That's a case control study. This is a slice of time, a cross-sectional study. 
like an ecological study, it's a slice of time. Do you have this? Do you have that? Let's try to put them together. Classic example, look at the NHAN study. There's a lot of cross-sectional studies out of the N, stands for national, I forgot the rest of it, N-H-A-N-E-S, a lot of studies. Could look at, okay, we want to, it's a cross-sectional study, so it's just a slice of time. Data collected at one point in time. But you could do a lot of studies with that. Like you could say, okay, let me look at B12 levels um, and see if, they, if they're correlated with uh, bone fracture, you know, whether someone is currently or, or has, you know. You can't, the problem with the cross-sectional study and any sort of slice of time study is you don't know what came first. You can't, usually, you can't be sure what came first. You can look at whether someone, you know, is suffering from a disease and whether what they're eating, but you can't say for sure whether the eating led to the, the disease or whether the condition or disease changed the diet. So that's what this cross-sectional study is. The difference with an ecological study is this unit of analysis, people. These are actual people, actual people. So forget this ecological thing. So now I'm going to give you a quiz. And I want you to think of two things, directionality and unit of analysis. 200 children aged 9 to 12 were recruited to evaluate the effect of body mass on foot structure. In addition to BMI, or body mass index, three reliable anthropometric measures were recorded, foot length, four foot width, and navicular height. So I can already, this is from the PubMed, but the hypothesis is pretty clear to me. They're hypothesizing that weight influences your foot structure, probably not the other way around. Although you can make an argument by if you have flat feet, you're not going to exercise as much and you're going to get fat. So you can make the argument both ways. But I'm assuming the hypothesis. But, that, but that's the point. You can argue it both ways. And do you see any directionality here? Are they starting by looking at people with, who are, have a high BMI versus low and looking for changes in foot structure? Negative. That's a forward directionality. That is a cohort study. Are they starting with people who have foot problems and looking at previous weight in the past? Negative. That's backward directionality. That's a case control study. Here they are not looking forward or backwards. They are simply saying we have this variable and we have that variable and we're going to put them together. So what's the directionality? There is none. Now it could be a cross-sectional study or an ecological study. It depends on what the unit of analysis is. Are we dealing with individual data or are we dealing with group data? Well, if you say individual data, you're correct. Because we are looking at 200 children aged 9 to 12 years. And they were recruited and we took measurements. It's individual data. So if it's individual data and it's non-directional, it is a cross-sectional study. All right, so that's, I'm sorry about the confusion. I meant to talk about uh, uh, cross-sectional studies first, but then we talked about, as you see, we talked about, and this is a non-directional, and they call it correlational study sometimes, because you're making a correlation just like you do in a cross-sectional. But let's call it ecological study, and let's realize that the unit of analysis here is not individuals, it's groups. So, we went through these examples. Ah, ooh, I meant to trick you with this one. I'm sorry, I hope you didn't, hope you didn't see the answer, but let's look at it together. This is trying to fool you a little bit. A survey was performed in nine European countries, and look at all those nine countries, um, as part of a social study. It had unusual intake of vegetables, and a lead correlates were collected by means of self-administered questionnaire among 11-year-old children. And occasionally people will look at this, something like this, and they'll say, oh, that's an ecological study. Why is it an ecological study? They'll say, well, there's no directionality. They're just looking at two sort of correlations between two variables that they got at one point in time. Very good, I'd say. Very, very good. No directionality. But why is it an ecological study? Well, looking at this in Europe, you know, the different countries, 
but is that really because they're looking at this in different countries? Does that mean that they're analyzing group data? Or could it be that they're, in, they're analyzing individual data? It just happens that they're doing it in different countries. Oh, that's right. They're looking at self-administered questionnaire, in other words, individual data among 11-year-old school children. So it is a, a cross-sectional study and ecological study. It's cross-sectional because they're individual data. Individual data. My arrows are going very slow right now. Come on. You can do it. Um, all right. So, guess what, folks? We are going to take a break. We're sort of done with identifying these five. You know, there are others, but they are hybrids. These are, these are five major study types that you should know and be able to, to distinguish based on directionality and unit of analysis, population level or individual level. So my keyboard is stuck at the moment. Oh, there it goes. Let's see if it's continuing to be stuck. It's acting very slowly. So before we go into measures of association, I'm going to take a short break. Um, it's been an hour since we took a break, so we we'll a break. It's 2.48. Come back at 2.53, if you would, five minutes, and I'll try to deal with this little screen that's going to happen with our organizer. Okay, see you in five. Okay, organizer. Hi, Paul. Uh, we suddenly have a very, very slow response. You see a text up? You see how it's done? Yeah. Let me see. Like I'm hitting the forward and backwards now, and I could probably tell you that in three seconds it's all going to catch up, but right now it's not moving. Okay. See, it's just caught up. I wasn't touching anything. Right. Um. Wondering if you use the arrows instead of the mouse, if that would work better. I'm not using the arrows. I'm not okay. Oh, I know. I know. All right. Let me just do one thing. Just in case. You know what I'm going to do? Mm -hmm. I'm going to get a new battery for this uh, keyboard. Okay. I won't assume the problem's on your end. I'll assume the problem's on mine. And I'll be back with a uh, few batteries before five minutes break. Okay? Great. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay. All right, I don't seem to have a problem, so if you want for the rest of the presentation, whenever you want to say, maybe next slide. Oh, yeah, no, that's fine, but I can't see that. Uh... I guess it's stopped recording. That's okay. Everybody, every, anybody who wants to um, contact me by email, I have to answer questions. Okay. If we go back to the um, previous slides, I'm, mine says null hypothesis now. Okay, which slide would you, are you looking for? I need to go, we need to go back a few. To which, to which what, what is the title of the slide? Um, uh, let's see, it was, um, we have to go back to measures of association. Okay. One second. So, um, so the way it works is that when I'm in it, it's not going to let you play with the mouse and keys, oh, um, but, when, yeah. but when you're moving it, I can't move it, so um, either to just choose. Do you want me to forward the slide uh, for you? Yeah, for I want you to do it. I want you to do it, if you don't mind. Okay, no problem. Just let me know when it's next slide, and I'll go ahead. Okay. So, um, welcome back. I'm sorry. Um, we have capable, we put the movement of the slides in capable hands, because uh, at first I thought the batteries on my keyboard went, but that's not the problem. So, um, They'll be moving the slides for me. Measures of association. You guys already know this because you well because you've been reading about epidemiology, but you also we calculated a risk ratio earlier. Do you remember? It's in an earlier slide. Um, cohort studies. In general, you could look at risks like we did and calculate risk ratios. You could look at rates like we did. Calculate rate ratios, and sometimes they're called hazard ratios. Um, sometimes they're called incidence density ratios. Incidence density refers to rates, while cumulative incidence refers to risks. I don't. I honestly don't use those terms except when I'm, you know, teaching epidemiology. But um, so I would just say risks and rates. But if you see hazard ratio or HR. It's really equating to a risk, uh, rate ratio. It's basically a rate ratio. Um, and you can calculate odds ratios in a cohort study. That's really the domain of a case control study. And so I'm, I'm really going to talk more about odds ratios in terms of, of, of case control studies. But it's something you can do. So it doesn't mean when you see an odds ratio that it's necessarily a case control study. So let's move to the next slide. A relative risk. You've calculated one. It's an estimate of the magnitude of an association between exposure and disease. We calculated a relative risk of two, and we determined that if there was no association, we'd have a relative risk of one. So two, one is no association. 1.1 is almost no association. 1.2 is a weak association. 1.3, 1.4 are pretty weak associations, but they're getting stronger. 1.5, 1.6, we're starting to get into moderately strong. It means, you know, once we get into 2, it means your risk is doubled. So 1.5 means your risk is increased 50%. 1.7 means your risk is increased 70%. 2.5 means you're now two and a half times more likely to get this outcome if you have this exposure, and on and on and on and on. And by the time you get into like three and four and five, you're talking about pretty strong relative risks. And I've seen them as high as, you know, 100, 40. I mean, but that's outrageously high. You're normally not going to see that. And if you do see something with an association that shouldn't be that high, like smoking and breast cancer, well, then I would redo your calculations. Um, and that, but that's a whole other lecture about how to make sure you 
you're doing your calculations correctly, or several lectures. But the important thing is to understand now what a relative risk is and what it means. Um, it indicates the likelihood of developing the disease for the exposed group relative to those who are not exposed. Doctor, what's my risk of this outcome if I have this exposure? What's my risk of, of uh, having this outcome if I'm diabetic as opposed to if I'm not diabetic? Or if I smoke as opposed to if I don't smoke? Oh, sorry. Um, next slide. So here we have data from a cohort study. We actually have data, and we're going to calculate a risk ratio. We did it before, but now we have all this confusing numbers in front of us and a confusing formula, which is none of, none of which is confusing. So let's just look at, in a cohort study, do we divide people according to exposure or disease? In other words, are we going to look at... Uh, the cells on the left versus the cells on the right, or are we going to look at the cells on the top versus the cells on the bottom? Believe me, if it's a case control study, we do something different. So what type of study is it? A cohort. So how do we want to divide people? This is really important. I've seen students just cut the cake the wrong way here. They cut the box the wrong way, and they get the wrong answer. So a cohort study, we're starting with what, and we're looking for what. We're starting with exposure. So how many people are exposed? How many people are exposed? We need a denominator for our exposed group. How many people? I could have put it here, but I want to make you work a little bit. If you say there are 74 people in our exposed group, you're correct. And likewise, there looks to be, I'm not a fast calculator, but it looks to be 1,191 in our unexposed group. So we have our denominators for our risks. What's our numerators? What's our numerators? Well, the exposed group has 74 people, out of whom, remember it's a proportion, out of whom 24 got the disease. So now we have our numerator, now we have our risk. It's 24 divided by 74. Oh, I see we have the numbers there, so I didn't need to calculate anything. Okay. 315 in the unexposed group, 315 divided by 1191. Now, I didn't calculate those, I didn't show the calculations for what each of those risks was, but rather I showed you the risk ratio. I took the ratio, I took 24 divided by 74, and then I divided that by 315 divided by 191, or the risk in the exposed divided by, and I got risk in the unexposed, and I got 1.23. So a 23% increased risk in the exposed group compared to the unexposed group. So since it's a disease, and that's not good, the exposure seems to be harmful. Of course, it's just a hypothesis, and we'll talk later about you know, when you know something is, is, is true or not, because you've probably listened to the news long enough to know that they're going to say, eat eggs, and then they're going to say, don't eat eggs. And then they're going to say, eat eggs, right? So for now, in, their, in our data anyway, it seems we have a 23% increased risk in the exposed group. Oh, sorry, I keep on. Next slide, please. Um, now, we already mentioned this. If our null hypothesis is that there's no association. And the ratio of anything to anything, 1 to 1, 7 to 7, 7.3 to 7.3, um, Oscar the Clown to Oscar the Clown. If they're the same thing, the ratio is going to be 1. That's why the null association is 1. And our null hypothesis is that the risk ratio equals 1 or that there's no association. Next slide, please. Alternate hypothesis. Two-sided means, well, we're hypothesizing the risk can be higher in the exposed or it could be lower. Most people will actually tell you if, if you're not, if you're unless you're you know absolutely, always go for a two-sided, like we're doing right now. The risk of the outcome in the exposed persons is not equal to. Could be higher, could be lower. Now you might think, well, what about smoking? I mean, can I just look at this as a one-sided? Well, actually, smoking reduces the risk of endometrial cancer and increases the risk of other cancers. So yeah, in general, a two-sided hypothesis is what you're seeing. 
an alternate hypothesis, two-sided. It's not equal to one. Next slide, please. Now we have one-sided hypothesis. Oh, we're, it's higher than one. That means the exposure is bad. Only bad, not good. Can't be good. Won't look at good. Only, or alternate is is uh, the risk ratio here is less than one. In other words, the exposure is protective. It's good. It stops you from getting this horrible disease. These are one-sided alternate hypotheses. I prefer two-sided for most applications. Next slide, please. Okay, interpreting the relative risk. Between 1.0 and 2.0, you simply subtract the risk ratio from 1.0 and it tells you the increased risk. Remember I said 1.7 means 70% increased risk, 1.2 equals 20% increased risk. That's how you would do it when the relative risk is between one and two. Next slide, please. When it's greater than two, it's simply, oh, it's two times higher, or it's 2.5 times higher, or it's 3.5 times higher, it's 9.7 times higher. It's simply the number of times your risk is increased. Next slide, please. It's less than one. It's 1.0 minus the risk ratio, and that gives you the decreased risk. So it's not risk ratio minus 1.0, like we did in the first one. It's 1.0 minus the risk ratio. So if you get a risk ratio of 0 0.75, what, what decreased risk is it from the exposure? It's 1.0 minus, it's a, minus 0 0.75 is 0 0.25, 25% less risk. So what would the risk reduction due to exposure be if the risk ratio is 0 0.25? It would be 75% risk reduction. What if it was 0 0.1? It would be a 90% risk reduction, right? Next slide, please. Okay, confidence limits. Um, and by the way, you're not going to have to memorize this slide. Just, just be aware of the fact that there are formulas. That's all I want to get across right now. Not whether this formula is perfect or whether you need to re remember it. Or E stands for, you know, when you, uh, you know, it's something that you do when you calculate. You, you, you probably have done uh, logs and anti-logs and things like that, but I'm definitely not going to talk about that today. That's the biostatistics. Just be aware that the risk ratio is one of the components in determining the confidence limit. And the confidence limit, basically, when you see a relative risk of 2.0 and you see a 95% confidence in interval of 1.5 to 2.5, technically they're saying, you know, if you were to repeat this study 95% of the time, the confidence limits would be falling around the true population relative risk. An alternate way to state it is I'm 95% confident that the, that the true relative risk lies between these confidence intervals. Not as accurate as the way I said it before, but, but serviceable. Next slide, please. Rate ratio. Instead of the ratio between the risk in the exposed and the risk in the unexposed, it's the ratio of the rates in the exposed. And the rates in, it's really not hard. You'll see RR sometimes will say, is that the rate ratio or the risk ratio? And the interpretation is so similar that sometimes, you know, just keep reading the paper and don't worry about the distinction. You know, it depends on how deep you want to get into it. But the risk ratio is an estimate of the, you know, the rate ratio estimates the risk ratio to, a, to an extent. So, but you technically, you'd have to say the rate of outcome in E is X times the rate of outcome in, uh, you know, exposed versus non-exposed. Think of it, you know, whatever I just said for the risk ratio, you can apply here to the rate ratio. Next slide, please. So if, the, if there's a, uh, you know, if there's a rate ratio of 2.5, I didn't give you the time units, but they, they cancel out, so I, that's why I didn't do that. Um, the rate of outcome is 2.5 times higher in the exposed than the unexposed. Next slide, please. Case control study. Next slide, please. Odds. 
Now, here's a, here's a question for you. Can you get a risk in a case control study, in a traditional case control study, where you're assembling cases of disease and non-disease people, and you're asking about past exposures? First of all, who decided how many cases you're going to collect? You did. Usually by what you could afford or what, or what, you know, or what would be reasonable for st statistical power, which you're going to hear about in your statistics book. What's the underlying population? What's the denominator? How many people are you dealing with? If we get all the cases, even if we get all the cases in the Knox County hospitals, does it mean that it's just Knox County people? who come to these Knox County, so you're not going to be able to get a, a risk or a rate. You're not going to have a denominator, and you are generally the ones who choose the numerator, so it doesn't happen. We're dealing with odds now. Now, what we have to, we're looking back at exposure, we need to look at what's called the odds of getting something. Um, horse racing uses odds. Um, epidemiology does too, when we're dealing with traditional case control studies. The odds is the ratio of probability that the event of interest occurs to the probability that it does not occur. I will show you an example. I'm pretty sure. The odds are often estimated by the ratio of the number of times that the event occurs to the number of times that it does not. Let's go to the next slide, and I've got my fingers crossed. Uh, well, we don't have the example yet. The, the actual numerical example will come, though. Relative risk requires an estimate of the incidence of the the disease. For most case control studies, we do not know the incidence of disease because we determine the number of cases and controls when the study is designed. We really don't know the underlying cohort. For case control studies, generally use the odds ratio. And the odds ratio estimates the risk ratio. whoop de doo That is amazing. If it's a very if it's not a very rare disease, though, we can overestimate the risk ratio. But in general, the odds ratio estimates the risk ratio assuming we didn't screw up our study um, and we didn't sample so poorly that we, that we have an invalid study, the odds ratio estimates the risk ratio. So you'll see in uh, case control studies, and you may wonder if you go through the literature, this happens all the time. I just saw one yesterday. They did a case control study and they talk about the risk. The risk, we showed the risk quick to it. Did they actually calculate the risk? No. They calculated the odds ratio and assuming that if all went well, they're estimating the risk ratio. And the risk ratio is still more inter intuitive than the odds ratio. How many are going to go to the, how many people are going to go to the doctor and say, given that I have the disease, uh, doctor, what are the odds that I was exposed to something? No, of course, of course, of course. It's not as important as saying, all right, given that I have this exposure, what is my, what, what, what is the risk of me getting this disease? So that's why, even though people calculated an odds ratio, they'll often discuss their results in terms of risk, and that's why. Technically, they're not doing, you know, they're not calculating risks, but they're making assumptions. Remember I said earlier, assumptions underlie just about all these things. Next slide, please. Okay, this is the technical definition for those who want to uh, spend time with it, which I don't right now. So next slide, please. It means the probability minus the one minus the probability. Basically, now I'm going to show you what it what, what that formula boils down to. And that is we're looking now at a case control study. So we're not looking at uh, all the smokers and looking at outcome. We're starting with the outcome. So think of it in terms of going down the case column and the control column. And we're looking at that. Now, what are the odds that a case smokes? What are the odds that a case smokes? Don't even look at the formula. Don't even look at the answer. Just ask yourself. Well, 112 cases smoke and 88 of them not smoke. So what's your first guess as to what the odds are uh, that a case smokes? What's the odds of exposure? Yeah, first guess, 112 over 88. And that's what that fancy formula was saying in the last slide that we didn't dwell on. It's 1.27. That's the odds of smoking in the cases. What's the odds of smoking in the non-cases, in the controls? Well, it's less than 1. It's 176 divided by 224, or 0.79. Now we can take the odds ratio. Now, if all goes well, we've estimated the risk ratio. 
So what's 127 divided by 0.79? Well, I don't know if we calculate that, but it's easy enough to calculate. It's around 1.5, 1.6, I would guess. Next slide, please. It's 1.61. Interpretation. The case's odds of exposure is 1.6 times that of controls. And if, you, if you're assuming that you properly estimated a risk ratio, you could very easily turn it around as long as no one objects and says you didn't do something right. Um, uh, you, you know, you violated the rare disease assumption, which is rare to do, but it could happen. Uh, but generally, people can start talking like, well, in our, in our study, um, exposed people were 1.6 times more likely to get the outcome. That's confusing, but I'm telling you why they do it, because they're making an assumption. Usually reasonable, but some people are less likely to, to, use the, to switch the terms than others. Next slide, please. Here's a simpler calculation for the odds ratio and the one that most of us will use. Um, it is the cross product. And it's the same. It absolutely, you could look at this mathematically, it's absolutely the same. It's one, if you take A times D, imagine this is a two by two table. Normally the A cell is the upper left. The B cell is the one to the right of it. The C cell is the lower left. Not the very lower left, but the 88. And the D cell is the 224. And depending on how you do your table, the 88 and, and the 176 can be reversed, but it makes no difference. 112 will always be, I mean, the A cell will always be where it is, and the D cell will always be where it is. You can play with that. But 112 times 224 is your numerator. So AD over BC. BC is 88 times 176, and you get the exact same number. It's just less calculations, and it's easier to calculate. 1.61. Same thing. Next slide, please. It's same interpretation as the relative risk. Odds ratio of 1 is no association. Greater than 1, positive. Greater, less than 1 is negative or inverse. Next slide, please. Yep, we did this already. Next slide, please. Now here's how you would, technically speaking, Say the, uh, you know, say the odds ratio and risk ratio. You'll see that they're worded appropriately. The odds of exposure versus the risk of disease. That's the correct and technically correct way to, to say it. But you will see that you know, once people get over that in the, in the discussion, they might be talking about their, their odds ratios as risks. Next slide, please. Ah, yes. Here's the conditions under which odds ratios can estimate relative risks. Cases are representative. In other words, you did your sampling correctly, like I said. Controls are representative. In other words, you did your sampling correct. And the disease is rare. Less than 10% of the people have it or get it. If it gets higher than 10%, you start getting slight increases in your odds ratio above and beyond what the relative risk would have been. Next slide, please. Here's showing why that's equivalent and why that's true in the rare case is because basically A plus B becomes B and C plus D is just about equal to D. Don't worry about this one. This is to go back on if you really want to play with it. Next slide, please. Now there's matching as we talked about earlier. Most matching these days is frequency, which doesn't really change the analysis. But in some studies, many in the past and some in the present, they do individual matching. Like we're going to, we have a case who's 39 years old, male, um, and lives in, uh, you know, Connecticut in this town. Let's find someone else, 39 years old, male, non-smoker, lives in Connecticut in this town, whatever. That's individual matching, and then you do a slightly different kind of analysis where you just look at, you know, discordant pairs. It's, it's, it's called McNamara's odds ratio, and uh, I don't think you need to worry about that. It's just for your information. Next slide, please. Uh, McNamara's, again, McNamara's um, odds ratio. Again, 
I think it's not going to be a problem for you on the test or most likely in your career. Next slide, please. Measures of impact. Okay, we'll try to go through this quickly. What we were just looking at, we called measures of association. Measures of association. Now we're looking at measures of impact. They measure the strength of the association, the risk ratio and odds ratio. But how much of a disease can be attributed to the exposure? How much of the disease risk, for example, can be attributed to smoking, cardiovascular disease? Odds ratio doesn't address this, and risk ratio. Next slide, please. Risk difference. Now, instead of taking the ratio between risks, ask yourself, what do you get if you take the, the difference between risks? So in other words, the risk is 30% in smokers of, of a particular outcome, and the risk is 10% in non-smokers. What does it mean when you take 30%, you minus 10%, you get 20%? Think about it for a second. First of all, would it be correct to say that in smokers, all of their disease is related to smoking? So 30% of their 30% is, you know, 100% of their 30% is related to smoking. No. If they didn't smoke, they still might be at risk for disease. So we're, we're subtracting out the background risk, the risk that they would have had if they didn't smoke. So what's left over? In this case, it says preterm birth, but it could just as easily apply to smoking. It's the excess risk. So I would have had 10% risk because that's what non-smokers have. But now I have 30% risk. So 20% of my risk is due to smoking. Now I'm going to give you a, a hard, not a moderately tricky question. What percentage of the smoker's risk? In that example I just gave you, 30%. Smokers have a 30% risk. Non-smokers have a 10% risk. The excess in smokers is 20%. What percentage of the risk in smokers is excess? What percentage of their total risk is excess, is due to smoking? So their entire risk is 30% and their excess risk is 20%. So what do you think? Two-thirds of their risk, in smokers I'm talking about, two-thirds of their risk, their 30% risk, two-thirds or 20% is due to their smoking. Okay, that's, that's called the etiologic fraction, which we'll get to, but I just wanted to give you a heads up. Etiologic fraction. In this example I just gave you, which I made up, two-thirds of the risk of these smokers, of these exposed people, R1. One refers to exposure, zero refers to non-exposure here. Two-thirds of their risk. They have a 20% excess risk out of 30% total risk, two-thirds is excess. And that says that a lot of their risk is excess. A lot of the risk they have is due to the exposure. That really suggests that they should stop that exposure regarding this outcome. Next slide, please. And here's a model. It's just a model of what I said, excess. you got to subtract out the background to get the excess. Next slide, please. Yeah, incidents not due to exposure. The excess is that above that. In this case, by the way, just looking at it, it looks like 50% of the total risk in the exposed is due to exposure. Etiologic fraction is 50%. You see that? About half of their total risk is excess or due to the exposure. And half of it is background, risk they would have had anyway. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. See that? Next slide, please. Uh-oh. A lot of slides here. Next slide, please. Yep, there you go. Just I'm just hammering home the point. Um, next slide, please. Yep, next slide, please. Okay. Um, here you can calculate the risk. Now, always start with the exposure and look at the total number of exposed. 
Now, if you, what if you tried to calculate this using column totals? It would be wrong because you're not looking at you're not looking at this as a as a risk. When you say risk, you, you hear in your mind cohort study. When you hear in your mind cohort study, you say I'm starting with exposed and non-exposed. So then nine out of the 846 exposed versus uh, uh, six out of the 1761 not exposed. Then we get a risk difference. We, we subtract out the background risk, which is the other group, and we're left with 7.23 per thousand is the excess risk due to sleeping prone. It's the added risk due to exposure. We're not we're not worried about the magnitude. We're not calculating a risk ratio. We're not saying the risk is X times higher. We're just saying this is the absolute difference. 7.23 children per thousand will have this outcome due to this exposure. It's an absolute, not a relative measure. I'm telling you the number. For every thousand people, we're getting this. It's not telling you X times or more times. That's a relative measure because it's saying this times this this, this, 10 times higher, or your risk is 11 times higher. Next slide, please. Uh, attributable risk percent. Don't freak out when you see this formula. It's basically the formula that I just gave you for uh, etiologic fraction. It's a just, that's just the way epidemiology is. I didn't make up any of these terms. Attributable risk percent here is the etiologic fraction. Same thing. Same thing. We just calculated it with the 20 divided by 30 in that example. This is just a fancy formula for that and a different name. Unfortunately, there are different names. Next slide, please. And so we now calculate the etiologic fraction or, or attributable risk proportion, whichever one you want to call it, 68%. Because we took the total risk in people who sleep prone as their, our denominator and we took the that part of it, that percentage of it that was due to sleeping prone. That's pretty high. Pretty high. It means two-thirds of babies who have such and such crib death in people who sleep prone, two-thirds of that are due to sleeping prone. And one-third of the crib deaths in people who sleep prone is due to Background, background, background risk of, of, of uh, crib death. Next slide, please. Um, there is something also called a population attributable risk, and that's where uh, you're not you're looking at in this entire population how much excess is there due to this exposure. So. Um, in the first bar, you see the risk in the unexposed. In the second bar, you see the risk in the exposed, about half of which is due to uh, the exposure. And then finally, you see the entire population. And because that's including unexposed people, you're looking at the, percent, the, the, the absolute number, first of all, of the excess in the population as a whole. And that really depends on how many. That will change by how many people are exposed. Three people out of a whole country smoke. The population attributable risk, no matter what the you know, no matter what you're dealing with, is going to be tiny. Suddenly, 90% of the people smoke. The population attributable risk starts to approach the the the, the attributable risk in the exposed, and that's what we're calling the attributable risk. So the population attributable risk is the risk in the population minus the unexposed. All right, it's getting confusing, maybe, but please ask questions. Um, just be aware when you're seeing attributable risk or etiologic fractions that you're just aware of, of whether they're talking about the population or in the exposed. Okay? Uh, next slide, please. Yep, next slide, please. Yep, now we're calculating a population of attributable risk. We're just starting with the total population instead of the population in the, in the exposed group. Right? Um, 
it's now 2.35 per thousand in the population. That's now saying whether you're sleeping prone or not, in this entire population, for every thousand people, 2.3 children are getting crib death due to sleep the due to the fact that people are sleeping prone or putting their children to sleep prone. So that will change when more or less people sleep prone. What the but the uh, attributable risk in the exposed will not change, just the population. And the percent. The percent you can calculate as well in the population. 2.35 divided by the 5.75. Okay, next slide. It's 40%. I just did that for you, but it's 40%. Now we're taking the population attributable risk divided by the population risk overall. Same thing, but now we're looking at the population as a whole, which includes exposed and unexposed. Next slide, please. Don't dwell too much on these things. Just know what they are. Know what they are. Um, summary of measures. Absolute measures address questions that we were just looking at. Just looking at absolute measures address questions about public health impact of an exposure. SS, excess risk in the exposed or population attributable, attributable to the exposure. It tells us also if pe more people smoke, we need this many more nurses or this many more doctors or this many more uh, health coaches. Relative measures address questions about etiology, cause, relations between exposure and outcome. Does smoking cause lung cancer? Well, yeah, it increases your risk tenfold. So one is more about public health measures, what we need to do, uh, how many personnel we're going to need. What's the impact in terms of how many disease, you know, disease is going to occur in the population? The other is, what's the causal relationship between X and Y? Next slide, please. Causal inference. Next slide, please. Okay, this goes back to uh, uh, the uh, infectious disease epidemiology, which is, uh, for many of us now, it's sort of ancient history. We're, we're, you know, there's still great, great infectious disease epidemiologists out there doing great work. But the latter half of the, you know, nowadays is, that's, to me, to my experience, is more chronic disease. But this goes back to, you know, like um, uh, a host, you know, you've got um, environment, for example, you have uh, swamps, an agent, you have malaria, and uh, you have a vector and you have a host, you know, that, that's people. Um, but we don't think about this so much nowadays with chronic diseases. And again, I'm a chronic disease epidemiologist, so I, I don't think about this very much at all. But chronic disease, um, ep uh, infectious disease epidemiology, uh, they talk a little bit more about this epidemiologic triad. Next slide. Yeah, next slide. Hi, Paul. I'm having trouble. Oh, there it goes. Yeah, there it goes. So here's um, the agent and the host and the environment, you know. How did they solve this problem? Did they get rid of the vector, the mosquito? No. Did they get rid of the host? No, that's us. Did they get rid of the bacteria? No, that's impossible but they drain the swamp, so to speak. Um, they, they, well, they, they did eradicate the vector too, you know. Um, so that's, that's actually what they did. They, they eradicated the vector. Uh, they, not completely, of course, but, you know, the more you eradicate the mosquito that carries malaria, in this case, and the more you drain the swamp, the environment that, that supports the, the vector, the mosquito, less swamps, less mosquitoes. Um, eventually, you know, malaria goes down. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so I'm going to tell you how people, especially with chronic disease, Austin Hill, Sir Austin Hill, um, sometimes called Bradford Hill, because his middle name is Bradford, and people have made that his last name now, Bradford Hill. 
but it's not his last name. But if you hear Bradford Hill, you're, they're talking about Sir Austin Bradford Hill. Worked on smoking and lung cancer and disease um, and said, I'm going to use some principles that I got out of this to, to help us with causal inference. Help us decide, you know, because if you see something on the news, eating eggs is going to kill you. Austin Hill would say, you know, I've got guidelines for this. You can't believe what you read from one study or, um, you know, we have to take things more systematically. And this is one approach. It's one of the more recent approaches, although it's now been uh, over 50 years. It's been 52 years. And this is still considered one of the important sets of, of guidelines. Some people call them criteria, but they're not. It's not a checklist. It's guidelines. Next slide, please. How strong an association is? If you see a risk ratio of 40 and someone says, well, you might have some confounding, your response will be, yeah, I might have some confounding. But seriously, do you think there's so much confounding that it produced a relative risk of 40 in a large population? Um, of course, it's possible, but stronger the association, the less likely. Now, if you have a risk ratio of 1.2, um, the slightest bit of confounding could account for that. So it doesn't mean that a weak association is not real. It just means it's harder to determine if a weak association is real or not. Consistency. Do you see the same thing over, you know, using different studies, and do you see the same thing in different countries? different populations. I mean, you certainly see it with smoking and, and heart disease or smoking and lung cancer. I just, you always see it. If a study doesn't show it, there's something wrong with the study. I mean, it's really consistent. Of course, consistency is not a guarantee because you could be making the same mistakes in all these studies. For example, if you looked at coffee drinking and lung cancer, you'd consistently see an association in total you control for the effects of smoking because coffee drinkers smoke more, at least they used to, in the days before Starbucks. And if you didn't control for the effects of smoking, coffee consumption did look like it increased lung cancer risk consistently. Specificity of the association, that goes back to, you know, that really doesn't work so well in chronic disease because smoking can cause a million diseases. And lung cancer can be caused by a lot of things, you know, genes, diet, radon smoking, of course. Um, but back in the days of, of, of uh, infectious disease, you know, specificity was important in determining. Like if people got, a lot of people had AIDS but no HIV, that would be a problem. If HIV seemed to cause a million different diseases, that would be a problem. It wouldn't be so clear that it was directly related to AIDS. The one biggie, the one, let's say, non-negotiable is temporal relationship when we talked about cross-sectional studies not always being able to determine what came first, the exposure or the outcome. You have an outcome, like, uh, oh, I have a great diet. Um, well, then why is it linked to heart disease? Why, is your, why, is it, why in this cross-sectional study does everyone with a great, you know, is there such a strong link between having a good diet and having a higher heart disease? Well, it could be that the exposure came second. First people got uh, heart disease, and then they changed their diet. So temporal relationship, we need to know, did the diet come first? So that's non-negotiable. If you want to you say something causes something, it better darn well come before the, the outcome. The exposure better come before the outcome. Biological gradient is otherwise known as dose response. The higher the dose, like radiation, the higher the risk. I mean, that does give us some comfort in, in uh, believing that there's an association between radiation and cancer. I mean, if you get one x-ray, no big deal. If you get a thousand x-rays or a million x-rays, bigger and bigger and bigger deal. Biological plausibility. Is, there, is, is, it, is it plausible? Some, I mean, what if they said, uh, tobacco companies said, and they did say, it's not plausible that smoking causes lung cancer. Oh, oh really? Doesn't smoking get absorbed in the lung tissue? Doesn't it turn black? Doesn't it, doesn't it create uh, DNA adducts and breaks in the DNA and it, you know, et cetera, et cetera? It's plausible, but, but, but just because something's not plausible doesn't mean that it's not real. It just means you have, maybe that you haven't come up with the right explanation yet or we don't know the right explanation.
So it's, not, it's, it's, it's helpful, but it's negotiable. Coherence is, well, you know, uh, is it consistent with the natural history of disease, for example, um, what we know about it? Um, for example, if we want to say H. pylori causes uh, stomach cancer or, or ulcer, if we look at, at time, you know, if the times when people lived in crowded conditions, the ulcer rate was higher. Well, crowded conditions are related to H. pylori. If the ulcer rates are higher, higher when there's crowded conditions, it's consistent or it's coherent. All right, it's not, it's not, it's negotiable, obviously, but it's, it's, it's one of his criteria or guidelines. Experiments, the more experiments you do, even in animals, no offense to PETA or anybody, but uh, the more data you have, I'm not advocating experiments, I'm just saying the more experimental data you have, the better. Experiments do go wrong, they do give wrong answers, but they do have an element in them, like we talked about earlier, of being able to assign exposure and randomize. Analogy is, that's, that's a very weak one, but uh, thalidomide seemed to cause, for example, thalidomide caused um, birth defects. Well, maybe another drug similar to thalidomide uh, might cause birth defects. I mean, we're more likely to, that's what Bradford, that's what Austin Bradford Hill said, we're more likely to believe if we see something happen with one drug, then see something similar with a, a similar drug. So analogy is negotiable. Everyone's negotiable here. Temporal relationship is non-negotiable. Um, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yep, next slide, please. Next slide, next slide, next slide. Yeah, I think I discussed this because I have a big mouth. I ran off on the other slide, so we don't need to worry about this one, except to say that validity needs to always be considered. You know, is your, do, do you have biases in your study that makes the uh, results, you know, if you see a relative risk of 40, you don't say, Eureka, you know. It shows that it's a true association. Well, bias can do anything that you think it can do, and even imagine it can do, it can do. So you always have to be aware of biases in studies. Internal validity is, did you get the right results for your data? I mean, is your pop for your population, did you get the right, right results? If there's no internal, internal validity, external validity is meaningless because external validity is, do my results apply to other populations? And of course, you need a valid result to even ask the question of whether they apply to other populations. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. Chance, that's where the p-values come in. That's different from bias. Bias is systematic error. Confounding is systematic error that relates to the fact that, um, remember, remember we talked about um, coffee drinking and lung cancer, okay? You don't control for confounding from smoking. Why? Now, coffee doesn't increase your risk of lung cancer, so feel free to go to Starbucks, unless people in Starbucks are smoking or you're smoking in Starbucks. But otherwise, coffee drinking is not associated with lung cancer risk. But if you were to do a population study where many people went on their coffee break and smoked, you would see a relationship between coffee consumption and lung cancer risk. But would it be due to the coffee? No. It's due to confounding because coffee consumption is related to smoking and smoking is related to lung cancer. Okay, it's that relationship that causes confounding, that interrelationship. But once you control for smoking, and there are ways to do that, you stratify or on smoking, or you control for it in a model, and most commonly now is you control for it in a model. And if you don't model yourself, you tell any competent data analyst, I want you to control for smoking. And as long as you have a smoking variable, and importantly, as long as you measured your smoking variable correctly, they can do that for you. They can say, here's the results for coffee without any influence from, from smoking. And you'll see nothing. Chances are you'll see nothing. Okay. Um, but if you didn't measure smoking properly, the data analyst can't do anything. 
oh, they can control for what you call smoking, but that's not going to control for smoking because you didn't measure it properly. So really, measurement is important. You could do a whole lecture on measurement. Measurement's important for everything. Next slide, please. Uh, we already talked about that. Is it, is, are your results related to, you know, can be applied elsewhere? Many times, yes. You're not going to say, okay, we found in the United States, the big study of, of nurses in the United States, that um, uh, smoking relates to, to breast cancer. Are you going to say, well, uh, that may relate in the United States, but it's not going to relate to in, in, in England? I would say, yeah, well, you know, you generalize about, you probably can generalize to England. The generalize would be, pro you know, because what's different about English people, you know, that, that's going to make this relationship any different? Yeah, you can generalize to England. You might not be able to generalize to people who are, let's say, not nurses or not educated, like, or not, you know, that's, that's a judgment call. That's a judgment call. Um, certainly, if you're looking at diet and some outcome in nurses, you might say, well, that's fine. In American nurses, it may not relate to uh, factory workers in China who eat a completely different diet and have completely, you know. So some things are not generalizable. And sometimes, yeah, you just have to be, it's a judgment call. You just have to be aware of that. Next slide, please. Random error, chance. A lot of times you give you you you. I'll give you a uh, something that looks strange, and I'll say explain it, and you'll come up with every explanation in the world. Oh, these people have more of this. They did. Be aware of the fact that underlying every possibility, there's always a possibility of chance, and a p-value is a saying. You know, given that we don't have bias, and given that the, that there's no association here. We would only see this by chance one out of a hundred times. That's a p-value of 0 0.01. 0 0.01. Anyway, next slide, please. Increasing sample size, by the way. If you ask three, there's a funny scene from a, a, an old TV show where the guy was trying to become like a, uh, the president of his club, and there were like seven people voting. And the guy starts saying, all right, one for him, you know, one for Jones. And Jones, his eyes get big, and his smile starts, two for Jones. His eyes get even bigger, and his smile gets even bigger, three for Jones. And then Jones shouts out, it's a landslide. And I always thought that was a funny line because, you know, three votes is not a landslide. Um, it's just like the margin of error that you see on a poll. You know, you see these polls and they say plus or minus 3%. We all know about presidential polls now, not to trust them. But if you take, if you see something that has a plus or minus on it, that can be, plus or minus can be reduced by just increasing the sample size or increasing the precision of your instrument, better instrument. Um, next slide, please. Any bi bias is a systematic error. Bias is bad. I should have a bullet point that said bias is bad. Try not to have it. Um, it invalidates your results. It's a distortion of the truth. Bias is a distortion of the truth. If there's an underlying truth to what's the risk ratio or what's, yeah, yeah, how much times the smoke increase and you don't get that right, if you, there's bias. You are getting the wrong, you are distorting that truth. And when you get samples, remember, that's the problem with samples. It would be great if you could get the whole population. Most of epidemiology is based on samples. Next slide, please. And bias can do everything. It can make it look like there's no association when there is one. It can make it look like there is one when there isn't one. There are three main types of, of bias. Selection, information, and confounding. Selection bias. Let's say I got a bunch of people. Um, let's say I want to do a study of, of pneumonia and diabetes. Okay, do a case control study. So we're going to go to hospitals and we're going to get patients who have pneumonia and find out if they have diabetes or not. What if diabetic patients with pneumonia are more likely to be hospitalized than than patients without? Diabetes. Doctor says, oh, you have diabetes, you have pneumonia, you're going to the hospital. 
I'm automatically only going to the hospital, I'm going to get people who are more likely to be exposed. And I'm more likely to see an association. That's a problem with selection. Another problem, another example, I make up dumb examples and I'm sorry, but let's say you're doing a smoking study and you want to see something, and you, go, you for control group, you go to a Quaker meeting, and they don't smoke, none of them smoke. They don't represent the population. I'm going to get the wrong answer. That's selection bias. Information bias is, well, the biggest example, I mean, information bias is anything that you get information that's wrong. I mean, the selection bias examples I gave you, they gave me the right, the right information, presumably. I'm not questioning whether they lied or not, or, or forgot or not. I'm just questioning whether I got the right group of people to represent the population. This is, information bias is different. It's saying you got the, you know, somebody said that you were exposed when you weren't exposed. Somebody said you had this disease when you didn't have this. That's information bias. So recall bias is one of the most famous kinds of information bias. You ask a case, were you exposed? Boy, they try hard. You know, they have this condition and they are going to explain it one way or another and they try real hard and they come up with a, a different answer than they would have come up with if they were in the control group. I don't have the disease, I'm not going to think about it too much. That's information bias and that's called a specific type called recall bias. Case control study, recall bias, they, they go together like uh, horse and carriage. They go with each other. The threat of it, anyway, always present. Uh, next slide, please. Ah, the direction of bias. Bias can be toward or away from the null, which is different from saying positive or negative. First, let me say positive or negative. Positive bias. You're taking the true number and you're distorting it higher. That's positive bias. So the truth is 1.2 and you say it's 1.3. That's positive bias. Negative bias, you can imagine. If the truth is 1.2 and you say 1.1 or 1.0 or 0 0.9, that's negative bias. Now, something different is whether you're biased toward the null or not. And this is important. Because if you say there's an association and someone says, well, uh, you know, you're biased toward the null, you have bias toward the null. Whether it's positive or negative doesn't matter. You say, that's great. I say there's an association. You say the bias is toward the null. So if anything, the truth is actually higher than what I said. So I'm being conservative when I say there's a relationship that's this strong. You're telling me, it's, if anything, it's going to be stronger. But if you don't find an association, bias toward the null is really, really much worse. Or it's harder to deal with. Because bias toward the null, and I said there's null, that means that there's a relationship somewhere, and I don't... You know, I didn't see it, and I don't know how much bias it was. I, I, I didn't see it. So if you get a null result, 1.0, a risk ratio, and you and, and the, somehow you know it's biased, then you know it was biased toward the null. Now, if you say there's an association and biased is away from the null, and every bias that you can think of is away from the null, you're kind of in trouble there, too because it means your results may be entirely due to bias. Okay, now this seems complicated, and it is, but then once you realize it, it's not. If the truth is 1.2, if you did the whole population accurately, it was 1.2 relative risk, and you found 1.5, not only is it positive bias, but it's away from the null, because 1.5 is further away from the null than 1.2 is, which is the truth. Just like if you found 0 0.3 when the truth was 0 0.6, it would be away from the null. If the truth was 1.5 and you found 1.2, you're still saying there's a relationship, and you're still saying it's a positive relationship, but you've underestimated it because your bias was toward the null. So when you think of direction of bias, think of toward the null or away from the null, and separately, Think of whether it's positive bias or negative bias. Two separate issues. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yep. Yep, we did this. Differential. The only thing I'll add to this is differential 
misclassification is if everyone, both cases and controls, for example, mess up their dietary intake and they forget. It's differential when controls do it differently from cases. Non-differential usually leads to bias toward the null. Differential can be toward the null or away from the null, depending on which direction the cases or controls differentially recall their exposure. If they differentially recall more exposure or less exposure, it could be toward the null or away from the null. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, I already talked about selection bias and I have more slides than time, so we'll skip this one. And you can definitely look at this later. Minimizing losses to follow up, if you're having losses to follow up. By the way, in a cohort study, that is your selection bias. You don't have selection bias on the, at the beginning when you're taking people in. People may refuse, but that's not a problem. Once you have your cohort, you have your cohort. And then the relationship in your cohort is valid. Sure, they could be it could be 90-year-old women only. You can worry about external validity, but internally you have no selection bias unless people start dropping out. And, the, and you know, that's why people encourage you to stay in if you find yourself in a cohort study. In a case control study, selection bias, well, there's more types of selection biases. Did you select your cases representatively? See, a cohort study is not sampling. That is your cohort. Case control study you're sampling, and you can sample long. So you have you have you have the opportunity to have selection bias when you sample cases, and you have the opportunity for selection bias when you sample controls. And all it means is the cases you selected are do not have the exposure history or exposure prevalence of all the cases you've selected out people with different exposure histories. And of course, controls as well. What you're saying there is that you've selected controls that don't represent the underlying population. Like if you go to Quakers and get smoking or drinking information, that does not represent the underlying cases. Okay, next slide. Next slide. Yep, next slide. We talked about this, so don't worry. Information bias. We talked about this too. We talked about recall bias. We talked about being just getting information wrong. If I lie, that's still information bias. If I forget, that's information bias. How about this? Um, we're doing a study of blood pressure, and the cuff doesn't work very well. Sometimes it gives an accurate blood pressure reading, sometimes it doesn't. Is that selection bias or information bias? Right? It's information bias. Absolutely. Next slide, please. We discussed recall bias. Next slide. We discussed recall bias again, but solutions. If you use controls who are sick with something else unrelated to the, the disease, they may be just as motivated. Make sure to use standardized questionnaires. Hopefully the subjects don't know the study hypothesis. So those are some solutions to recall bias. But there's no guaranteed solution to recall bias. Very important to note. There's no guarantee. No guarantee. Have a time machine and go back and see exactly what they did. That's the only solution. And that, of course, is impossible. Next slide, please. By the way, we just passed 200 slides, so woo, 200 slides. And uh, next slide, please. Interviewer bias is pretty straightforward. Next slide, please. As the interviewer already knows, like, uh, I know that you're exposed, so I'm going to keep questioning you until you tell me the right answer. That's why we do blinding when we can. Next slide, please. Uh, inaccurate measurement, misclassification. It's a type of information bias. It's just not, uh, yeah, I mean, recall bias is a misclassification bias as well. Uh, so they're, they're basically, misclassification being the broader term, recall bias being the more specific example. Misclassification could also be from a faulty 
fake nanomometer or a faulty blood pressure cuff. So that's not recall, but it's another form of misclassification by it. It says that you're, you have hypertension when you don't. That's misclassification. It says you don't have hypertension when you do. That's misclassification. Next slide, please. Up, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, we already talked about confounding. Um, there's a lot, you know, there's more examples to, to you know, to, to bring it home for you. Um, and you'll have those. But think about the, I mean, just keep going back to that coffee smoking one. And, uh, you know, keep thinking about that one as well. And if you go back to the Florida, uh, you know, the, the age adjustment we did, Florida versus Alaska, that was confounding by age. Florida had more age. But age was related both to Florida was both age was related both to the states and to the mortality outcome. Confounding. It's related to both, the exposure and the outcome. Um, so there's a little more points to go over there. Hopefully I can help you with that if you have a question. But I'm going to end here. One, because we've done over 200 slides and there, there's not that many more left. Two, because with my big mouth I discussed a lot of these things earlier in one way or another. And three, because I want to answer any questions you have. And most importantly, we have just over a minute left in this in this talk, and I, I'm not giving you very much time to ask your question. So this is where we'll end now. And uh, um, questions, please. Or if you don't have a question, write the second. Um, email me. Take time to think over your question. Take time to look over your notes uh, that you took in in your classes and 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 in here, and uh, you know, uh, you can email me with a question if you don't know how to phrase it right now. Great. Well, thank you very much, Paul, for taking time today to speak with us on the topic of epidemiology. Um, thank you all to everybody who is participating on the call today as the National Board of Public Health Examiners presented its third in our sixth um, in our series of six webinars geared towards explaining the domain areas of public health to help you prepare for the CPH examination. Um, as we mentioned, these webinars will be placed on the MBPHE website for future viewing and listening. Um, and please be sure to register for the remaining three webinars. Uh, any questions can be sent to Paul Terry directly or to info at mbphe.org. Uh, you should see an email from me on Monday or um, in a few, maybe in a few hours, um, that has the um, link to this PowerPoint um, along with um, Paul Terry's information and um, the, the PowerPoint slides attached. Um, but if you do not get that email, please feel free to check the website um, and you can rewatch this presentation again on our website. So thank you to Paul, and thank you very much to everyone else. I hope you have a great weekend, and good luck on the CPH exam. Goodbye.